thank you for coming to this, not the annual, second annual, but this is the biannual uh, pastry demo with Boy Ron. Uh, Carmen is right behind me. But first, I'd like to introduce two people. Juan Galoto, Galoti, sorry, he's right out there. He is the North American sales manager. If you have any questions, technical questions, anything like that, feel free to ask him. Okay. Uh, and then next we have Tony Spire. She is the uh, U.S. Western Region Sales Manager. So they've come all this way to this presentation. Welcome. Um, we're so excited to have you here this morning. Um, I'm just going to give a brief introduction. Most of you, I hope, are familiar with Les Vergeres Boiron. Um, we have an over 75 year history of offering 100% natural frozen fruit purees um, for chefs such as yourself. We, um, we've been in business, as I said, over 75 years. We serve over 80 countries with our, our purees. So um, today we're going to show you some new and new exciting ways to use them. Our mission is to contribute to your success um, with a range of flavors in accordance to your needs. So in your little goodie bags, one of the sheets in there is just a listing of all of our flavors um, and some other treats for you. There's also a guide in there that you can follow along with today. Um, I'm going to start, though, with a brief video, which will just give you a little history of Les Bergeres Boron and why we are unique um, to the world of purees. So if you can call your attention to the screen. This is a peach, a peach selected by Les Bergeres Boron. It will become an exceptional puree. Turning fruit into puree may not seem hard. You just have to crush them and there you are. The reality isn't that simple. Since Le Verger Boiron began, we have developed a unique process to guarantee consistent taste and sugar content throughout the year. This regularity is obtained by the assembly technique. It involves mixing several varieties, origins or vintages of different fruits. The first step consists in creating the recipe for this assembly. It is designed by our R&D team assisted by chefs, pastry chefs and mixologists. Once the recipe has been approved, our purchasing department searches for and selects producers throughout the world according to very strict specifications. Each producer harvests their fruit at maturity and sends it to our site in Valence in the south of France. Each batch undergoes an organoleptic, physical, and chemical control. If the quality is not satisfactory, the batches are returned. Each validated batch is identified and classified. A precise classification of each batch and a large stock of each variety are required for assembly and processing. The fruit is then sorted, washed, crushed, and finally refined. New tests are carried out to check that the texture and sugar content meet the requirements of our recipe. To guarantee microbiological safety, we proceed with the flash pasteurization stage. It is a crucial stage where every minute and every degree counts to guarantee food safety while preserving the organoleptic qualities and aromatic power of the fruit. After rapid cooling, the purees are put in trays frozen and packed in cartons before being shipped to over 80 countries. In conclusion, as you have seen, each frozen fruit puree by Les Vergers Boiron is unique and designing them is an art in itself. An art invented and carried out by Les Vergers Boiron since 1942 to let cooks, pastry chefs and barmen unleash their creativity and appeal to gourmets all over the world. Les Vergers Boiron, Together, let's share the best of the fruit. You'll see that we've got a new package. It's a little um, taller. It's water resistant. It's got um, a two pour spout, so you can open up the seal, or you can just peel a little piece off and, pure, and pour it for your needs. So 
We're always working to improve ourselves to make your lives easier. You're here to see Chef Michael. So I'm pleased to introduce our esteemed Chef Michael Lesconis, whose pastry philosophy manifests itself in a style of desserts that balance art and science. Michael is formerly the executive pastry chef of Le Bernardin in New York, um, helped for eight years, helping them earn three Michelin stars. He's now creative director at the Institute of Culinary Education in New York. And in his copious free time, Michael also has opened a dessert bar on the Upper West Side where he serves three course plated desserts um, every night from Tuesday to Sunday. So he's a busy man, but he's here to offer his, his creativity, his knowledge, and his use of foreign purees in his creations with you. Um, I encourage you to ask questions if you want to make this interactive, but without further ado, I introduce Chef Michael Lesconis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, uh, Jimmy, Chef Matt, for uh, having us here at Chef Zone. I was here two years ago. Um, and it seems like an eternity. I need to get here more often. So um, uh, again, thanks for coming. We're going to uh, be looking primarily um, at uh, confections today, uh, utilizing the bois rhum purees. Um, what we'll probably do is, is do a lot of production in the first half, and then everything is going to kind of come together in the second half, so you will get a chance to taste everything that we're working on. Um, a lot of what I do, there's a little list of everything you have. Of course, you have the recipes in front of you as well. But a lot of what I do in my uh, daily life, uh, mostly in education, but also as a pastry consultant, at any given time, I've got four or five part-time jobs going on, as well as um, you know, working with young cooks that are working with me. Um, a lot of what I'm doing is talking about uh, underlying science of cooking and pastry in particular. And I um, often use the analogy of you know, what a savory cook does. Um, Imagine you're making a soup and you have a pot in front of you and you can t taste and adjust and tweak that soup from start to finish. Um, whereas a lot of what we do as pastry cooks requires uh, predicting the future. You know, we're putting things together in such a way that um, maybe it's not a, an edible or certainly a palatable form, say a raw cake batter. And I'm gonna put that raw cake batter in an oven for 30 minutes. And we have to know based on the ingredients that we combined and how we use them, based on the ingredients that we put together and how they've been combined, uh, it's gonna dictate how the cake is gonna bake in the oven for that 30 minutes that we can't touch it. We can't take that cake out of the oven halfway through and say, add a pinch of baking powder to it. It doesn't work that way for a lot of the things that we do. So it requires us to kind of be a little bit more hardwired to understand underlying science of things. So as we go through a lot of the things today, uh, not only are we gonna be talking about applying the purees, but also kind of kind of chipping away at some of that underlying science. And again, I encourage you guys to ask questions. It's a big group, but I think we can, we can be interactive a little bit. But this idea of um, understanding the composition of our ingredients and their structure and how they function in recipes is really important on three levels. It A, helps us uh, just make better stuff, which is hopefully always the goal, you know, co continual refinement. Uh, B, it uh, helps us fix, fix mistakes. I'm sure we've all been there. How many times have you come in mid-shift into the kitchen and you immediately have to put out fires? Chef, this didn't work. Chef, this didn't work. And you, know, you weren't standing over their shoulders. They were making whatever didn't work. So you have to understand sort of the mechanics of that recipe to troubleshoot that. And certainly understanding um, some of this underlying science certainly helps us understand that troubleshooting. And then thirdly, and um, sometimes this is a, uh, a little bit of a, a, a gray area or for, for younger cooks, it's something that you have to sort of progress into in your own evolution. But I think under, understanding this kind of uh, scientific aspect of cooking also leads to creativity. Because very rarely in cooking does a new dish or an idea for a new technique hit you as you're walking down the street. It's usually a very deliberate, thoughtful process where you know, I, I know the properties of this, what if I apply it over here to this? Maybe I can come up with something new and novel. So I spend a lot of my time talking about 
composition and function of ingredients. So let's actually jump in. I'm gonna kind of jump around the recipe book a little bit and we'll jump around the slides a little bit. But we're gonna start working with the, uh, the pot de fouille. A few years ago, I uh, wrote an article on pectin and, and pot de fouille in particular. And uh, the first sentence of that article was pot de fouille is boring. Um, because it kind of is, and it's, it's on almost every pedophore plate and you know amenity uh, plate. But there's a reason for that because it is so simple to produce and rather inexpensive to produce in large quantities. But I'm always trying to think of ways to kind of switch things up to kind of make it a little bit more interesting. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna combine two flavors. We're gonna combine strawberry with uh, lemongrass. Does everybody know that Boiron makes a lemongrass puree? It's really, I, I think it's one of the more special things because it is so unique, because it is one of those things that typically we have this hard stock of lemongrass that we have to somehow infuse into things. And there are sometimes things that an infusion doesn't really work really well. Um, so this is a really, really interesting product. We're gonna give you some to taste here in a moment. But I love the idea of blending flavors together to again, just make it a little bit more interesting than just strawberry pot de fouille. So pot de fouille always starts with heating our purees. And here, because the uh, intensity of the lemongrass is so strong, uh, I'd rather do doing 50-50 uh, strawberry and lemongrass. Uh, it's about 60-40 uh, in this case. So if you guys want to start off, how do you guys want to do the sampling here? This is our uh, strawberry puree. When I was uh, at the factory in Valence, uh, France a few years ago, um, I actually saw the strawberry puree being made. First off, it was kind of interesting because it was uh, the middle of February. I'm like, wait a minute, they're making strawberry puree in February. Um, but actually they buy so much fruit at peak season that they actually freeze it themselves in the factory. So they can, and strawberry being one of the more popular flavors worldwide, uh, they do find they have to make that several times throughout the year. So it's always kind of at peak condition. Um, but what's really interesting is um, every batch um, is essentially customized to the extent that there is a sort of benchmark flavor profile for every single puree. Um, and every time, and obviously fruit is an agricultural product that can change uh, from season to season. Um, the first step in crafting the puree is taking those fruit samples into the lab and adjusting the sugar content to where it's an ideal Brooks level, an ideal flavor. And they're also combining fruit from perhaps several different origins. So when I saw the strawberry puree being made, it was a combination, I, if I recall, of strawberries from France, from Poland, from Finland. And they had already done the testing in the lab and they found just the right proportion of those three origins to maintain the consistency. And that's what's always kind of impressed me with um, the purees is how they achieve that consistency. Okay, so once our fruit puree has started to warm, we're gonna add our pectin. We can talk about pectin a little bit. Uh, pectin comes from, uh, commercial pectin typically comes from one of two sources, either apple or citrus. However, virtually every plant in existence contains pectin to some degree. It's actually the sort of the glue that holds cell walls together. But different plants, fruits and vegetables and whatnot contain more or less pectin. We are using a, kind of a standard apple pectin, or actually my, my preferred pectin is uh, what's called yellow pectin. In France, they call it Ruben Jaune. I have no idea where that term comes from, by the way. Um, but the important thing to know about pectin is that first and foremost, it has to be dry blended into another ingredient, such as a portion of our sugar. 
because as soon as pectin comes into contact with moisture, it starts to swell up as it absorbs that moisture. And that's how we get lumps of pectin in our preserves or pot de fouille or what have you. So we wanna really thoroughly dry blend this, typically with five times its weight, in this case, of sugar. But I have a little kind of fact sheet up here about pectin. Again, it's found in nearly all plant material. Helps if I use the right burner. All plant material but commercial pectin is, is derived pre predominantly from apple and citrus sources. How would we describe the final texture of something thickened with pectin? It's a very soft texture, but it's also short in the sense that it's not elastic or stretchy. Um, it's, it's, it kind of breaks up in, in the mouth as we consume it. Another really interesting uh, aspect of pectin, certainly compared with say gelatin. Gelatin is what we would call thermoreversible, meaning you can make a gelatin gel, you can set it, you can melt it down and recast it with really no adverse effects. And there are other hydrocolloids, gelling agents that, that have that property as well. Pectin, however, uh, is not thermoreversible. Has anyone ever tried to melt down pot de fouille and recast it? Doesn't work. <laughs> um, so it's not thermoreversible, so we can't melt it down. Another interesting thing about pectin, and this is often how um, it's marketed or labeled, is um, it's setting temperature, or more specifically, how quickly it sets, which is directly tied to its temperature. So we have fast setting pectin, we have slow setting pectin, we have sort of a medium setting pectin, and depending on what application we're using the pectin in, um, that, that setting temperature, setting time might be important. So for us, we want a fairly medium or even slow setting pectin, which will allow us to deposit it in whatever forms we're looking for. Uh, but if, for example, we were making a preserve where we want to suspend pieces of whole fruit in it, we would want a fast setting pectin so our fruit solids didn't sink to the bottom before the pectin, the, the preserve, actually set. Okay, so we're, we're warmed up here on the puree. I'm gonna whisk in that initial measurement of sugar and pectin. Of course, if you look at the recipes, I call sugar sucrose, because that's what it is on a technical level. We use lots of different sugars, plural, in the, in the kitchen. So I'm a bit of a nerd, I call it sucrose, but I've done classes where if I don't make that statement, I'll get an email a week from now. Chef, I've been looking for sucrose everywhere, I can't find it. It's just sugar. So one of the things that, that often kind of uh, makes me a little unhappy about pot de fouille is the fact that it's typically equal parts fruit and sugar. And what does that mean? It means that the finished preparation is fairly sweet, right? Um, and, and that's why I like to, I enjoy trying to work ways around that or even just playing with the flavors a little bit. Um, but our remaining sugar in the form of more sucrose and a little bit of glucose syrup. It's really, really important here that we add the bulk of this additional sugar slowly in stages. When I get a phone call or an email saying, my pot de fouille didn't work, you know, my first question is, did you scale everything properly, cook it to the proper temperature? And if you know, the answer to those questions is yes, typically what's at fault, if you have a, a poor setting pot de fouille, is that all of the sugar was added all at once. What happens in that case? The temperature drops significantly. And when the temperature drops, the pectin kind of thinks, oh, the temperature drops, I'm ready to set. And it'll set prematurely and not as strong as it would otherwise. So it's really important to add this sugar in stages. We wanna maintain a base temperature here of at least 160, 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Why don't we go ahead and we'll uh, 
also give you a taste of this lemongrass, which is really, really cool. Another puree that I'm not working with today, but is, is similar in, in, in concept, is our uh, ginger puree, which has a slight uh, like pineapple base to it. So the, the, all the sucrose we're adding here is obviously the sort of bulk sweetener. The glucose syrup, what, what's the glucose syrup, what's its role here? Primarily it is to inhibit crystallization. So regular sugar, sucrose hates to be dissolved. So it's always gonna try to find ways to recrystallize back into a solid either through the cooking process or once the product is finished and it's sitting around for a few days or a few weeks. So the glucose syrup that we're adding will inhibit that. It's also lowering the overall sweetness. It's a lot of information on this screen, but basically it's, it gives us a, a quick glance of the properties of all of the common sweeteners we use in a pastry kitchen and then some that we'll probably never use like the, the artificial or what we call high intensity sweeteners. But as pastry cooks, you know, what, what defines what we do? We add sugar to stuff, right? Um, but I think it's always important to always be mindful of the level of sweetness of things that we're, that we're preparing. So, if we look at the column that says sweetening power, that will show us in, in, in relative relation to sucrose, which some food scientists gave a score of 100. And, the, and what that score tells us is the perceptible sweetness of sugar. And all these other sweeteners we're gonna use might fall above or below that in terms of a numerical score. So some things like invert sugar or honey are gonna score higher. So they're perceptibly sweeter. But then a lot of sugars fall below that. And we can use those sugars with low sweetening power to also balance sweetness, especially when we look at ice creams and sorbets, which we won't really look at today. But that's also a benefit of the glucose syrup here is that it is lowering our overall sweetness. All right, our final cooking temperature here is about 223 Fahrenheit, about 106 Celsius. And with a sugar syrup, you know, water boils at what temperature? 212 degrees. What allows us to cook a sugar syrup above that? It's the fact that sugar has the property of raising the boiling point when it's dissolved in water. And then we can actually use that temperature to also kind of correlate the solid and water content of that syrup. And that's what makes a lot of confectionery possible. So if we uh, look here, here's a, a chart that has sugar syrup temperatures. And then sort of that old school descriptive terminology that most of us don't really use anymore because we have fancy thermometers that can take the temperature of our sugar syrups. But before we had thermometers in the kitchen, how would you, you know, determine the concentration of a sugar syrup? You stuck your fingers in ice water and then into hot sugar syrup and then back into ice water without burning yourself. And how that syrup behaved after it cooled back down kind of correlated to these general temperatures. And then the third column shows us an estimation of the amount of solids or sugar that remains in that syrup at that temperature. So cooking a pot de fouille, fairly low temperature, below 230 degrees, we're looking at about 75% solids content versus 25% moisture. That's gonna give us the consistency of our finished pot de fouille, but it's also what allows our pectin to properly set. So pectin, if we advance again, 
What does it require? It requires a high solids content. So for something like a pot de fouille, we're looking at about 75% solids content, which is why we're cooking it to this specific temperature. But it's also gonna require uh, a drop in pH. What does that mean? pH is a scale of acidity and alkalinity that goes from uh, zero to 14. Zero is about as acidic as you can get. 14 is about as alkaline as you can get. Seven is neutral. So we wanna drop the pH slightly and that's sort of the final cement for our pot de fouille. I always add that, however, at the end of the process. And we are about one degree away from our 223 Fahrenheit. Are most of us working in Fahrenheit or Celsius or a little bit of both? Yes, Fahrenheit, Celsius. When I can, I'll, I'll try to give you both temperatures. Okay, so we hit our 223 degrees Fahrenheit, about 106 Celsius. We're gonna cut the heat, and then I have citric acid to lower that pH. Uh, a lot of pot de fouille recipes will dictate combining your acid with an equal amount of water just to dissolve it so it evenly disperses. I find I've never had acid clump up on me, so I just dump it in in dry form and just whisk it in. No ill effect whatsoever. Now, depending on what kind of pectin we're using, the clock is ticking, right? So we have a fairly medium or slow set pectin, so we'll have time here to pour our mixture into a dropper like this and deposit it into a silicone mold. We could either pour it into a slab, cut it later, but I like the, uh, the options that a silicone mold gives us. So what I'm gonna use is a uh, kind of a cool three-dimensional silicone mold that's in a sort of a canal shape, and then also do some, some flat pieces. Does anybody have any questions about pectin or pot de fouille? That's either a good sign or a bad sign. I can't tell. Uh, I mean, well wrapped in an environment that's not too humid. I mean, pot de fouille will never go bad. There's way too much sugar for any bacteria or mold to grow, but it'll certainly dry out and, and eventually make start to crystallize despite our best efforts, you know, using glucose. It's more about how it's stored. But you could probably hold on to pot de fouille for weeks, if not a couple months. I've never done it personally, but I imagine you could also freeze it. I mean, I typically don't use a freezer much for long-term storage. I, I like to think of a freezer more as a tool, as a piece of equipment to help um, you know, achieve certain goals. But I have heard of people freezing it. The, the, really important thing to consider when freezing any type of confection, even uh, chocolate, is that it's very, very well wrapped or sealed. And then when it's brought back to room temperature, it's a very slow multi-stage process. Because what happens when we take something from very cold to very warm, especially in a humid environment, we get condensation, right? And outside humidity is the enemy of virtually all confections. But if you take something from the freezer into the refrigerator over the course of a day or two, and then from the refrigerator to room temperature over the course of a day or two, the whole time it's very well wrapped, protecting it from humidity from the environment, you should be fine. What did we think about that lemongrass puree? It's pretty, it's pretty intense on its own, but it, it adds a really nice sort of layer of flavor to things. <laughs> 
when I wrote that article on pectin and pot de fui a few years ago that I mentioned, it also got me thinking of how we can make it less sweet. So I started playing around with alternative sweeteners, not to great effect, unfortunately, but a really interesting exercise and kind of understanding it a little bit better was uh, making a pure water pot de fui. Obviously it had sugar in it, but it's kind of weird to taste thickened water with no other flavor in it. But it was an interesting exercise, but it got me thinking, you know, if we could make a savory pot de fui, would that even be something that's delicious? Um, Cause we usually don't, I mean, I guess with the exception of some, um, you know, uh, textures in Asian cuisines that are kind of soft and gummy and jelly. Uh, we usually don't associate that kind of pot de fui texture with savory things. But someday I'll make a mushroom pot de fui or something that's salty. Okay. I think we're good there. So I'm gonna go ahead and let this set up. This should set up at room temperature within 30 minutes or so. So next let's turn our attention to our yogurt and blackcurrant bonbon. So there's another really interesting um, property of pectin is that it um, has a sheer thinning property. And what, what does that mean exactly? Well, there's a, a branch of physics uh, known as rheology, um, where water and anything beha that behaves like water uh, is referred to as a Newtonian fluid, a Newtonian liquid named after Isaac Newton. But there are a lot of fluids, a lot of substances that don't behave like water does in very unpredictable ways. And we call those non-Newtonian fluids. And non-Newtonian fluids can behave in different ways where if we apply what's called shear or force, meaning we whisk it, we put it in a blender, um, they either get thicker and then don't revert back to their, their thin nature or they thin out and don't revert back to the thick nature but then there's an interesting third category known as thixotropic, where things might change and then they will eventually revert back to the way they were. Um, thixotropic things are kind of weird, like uh, cornstarch and water. If you have just the right concentration of cornstarch and water, you can actually form it into a solid ball. But then if you let it sit for a while, it'll thin out. And you can actually, um, probably Google videos that show physics students filling up little wading pools full of cornstarch and water, and they'll get a running start, and they'll literally run on the surface of it without sinking. But if you were just to step in it and stand there, you would sink because the friction of running across thickens it at the surface just enough to keep you afloat. Um, maybe a little bit more relatable is uh, ketchup. You know, how, we, how do we get ketchup out of a bottle? We do this a lot. And we, you would think it's gravity and inertia forcing the ketchup out of the bottle, but it's actually what, what's helping is as it goes through the neck of the bottle, it's actually the friction against the bottle that loosens it up slightly. And then when it hits the plate, it'll slowly thicken back up. Thixotropic. But what we're gonna look at is the ability of pectin to have a shear thinning property. So if we look at the, uh, the black currant gelée, it looks just like a, uh, a pot de fui, with a, a, a one, one minor exception. So we have fruit puree, we have an initial measurement of sucrose blended with pectin. Then we have the, the bulk of the sugar, we have sucrose, we have glucose. We're actually adding a little bit of isomalt. Does anybody actually put isomalt in edible things or do we just use it for sugar show pieces? Um, but it, it is, perfectly edible as a sweetener. Uh, the great thing about isomalt, if we were to go back and look at that sugar chart again, its sweetening power is super low, about half that of sucrose. 
Okay, so we're going to come back to why we're using isomalt in this uh, in this gel, and then of course finishing it with citric acid. So I just showed you the procedure for making pot de fouille. The, the procedure for the black currant gel is the same, except we're not cooking it to a, uh, a high temperature. We're literally just bringing it to a boil and stopping there. But it does produce, you know, a, a, a firm gel, maybe slightly softer than a pot de fouille. But what happens if we just slowly start to whisk this? And from a physics perspective, we're creating what's called shear. This is going to thin out. The more we whisk it, the softer it gets. And it will never revert back to a really firm jelly consistency. So this shear thinning property can actually work against us sometimes. Like, for example, as that pot de fouille, even if I cook it to the right temperature, everything is scaled properly. If I were to start to, for some reason, agitate it, just as it started to get to its setting temperature, it would also set a little bit looser than it should. But here, we're using it to our benefit. So you see how much it's softened up, right? So we're going to be utilizing this in a bonbon. How many of us do chocolate work on a regular basis, daily or weekly? Okay. So a chocolate bonbon, one of the primary considerations is shelf life. Because we're making a ganache that's uh, typically based with cream. And 60% of cream is what? Water. And water is what will feed bacteria and mold and shorten the shelf life of our bonbon. So certainly from a chocolatier's perspective, somebody who does just chocolate, shelf life is a huge consideration. In a restaurant or hotel, typically when we make bonbons, you know, they're consumed relatively quickly. So we don't think about it that often. Um, but this idea of taking what would otherwise be a firm, sweet pot de fouille, and looking to transform it into something that is less sweet, uh, that is soft, but also has the shelf life requirements that we need, is where this, this, this recipe was sort of born. So it's kind of a classic uh, way of doing a, a bonbon where you take a slab of traditional pot de fouille that's already set, you pour a ganache over it, you cut it, you enrobe it, uh, but again, you have a very sweet pot de fouille and a very firm texture. Um, to adapt that to a molded bonbon, that allows us to create really soft textures, which is, is really the goal, right? We want to maximize the uh, contrast between a very thin, brittle chocolate shell and a very soft, creamy interior, right? Um, so the shear thinning aspect allows us to, to soften that pot de fouille to a, a pipeable jam-like consistency. Uh, and then by utilizing a sweetener like isomalt, we can lower the sweetness. And when we lower the sweetness, we amplify the flavors that are already there. So um, two really important considerations. Okay, so we have this now pipeable black currant gel that's inspired by a pot de fouille preparation. Next, we'll produce a ganache. So this is our yogurt ganache. While I set this up, let's talk a little bit about um, one of my favorite aspects about Boiron is the fact that um, they offer so much amazing technical support. Over the years, they publish all these great, you know, parametric recipe charts. This is this happens to be for sorbet, uh, but they do make them for things like pot de fouille, um, and ganaches and mousses. 
and caramels because every fruit is gonna behave a little bit differently. It's great to have these parametric recipes as a guide. In addition to these parametric recipes, obviously there are also um, you know, recipes for finished desserts and entremet and confections and things like that. Um, another really cool feature uh, that uh, they came out with about a year or two back is a sorbet calculator. Uh, it requires an understanding of um, balancing percentages of ingredients in a sorbet. Um, but basically you enter the percentage of sucrose or dextrose that you want in your sorbet and the quantity you want to end up with and it'll calculate a recipe for you, which is super, super cool. I've been thinking about doing an app for years and they beat me to it. Um, and then uh, another interesting um, feature is there is an app too where most, if not all of the recipes that end up on the website can be accessed on your phone at any time. Okay, so. No worries. So our ganache, we're starting with cream. We have uh, some vanilla as a flavoring. And we're using some invert sugar, or you, you may know it as trimaline, which is a brand name. The invert sugar, what's its role? Um, yes, it's gonna add a little bit of sweetness, but we're certainly getting a lot of sweetness from the white chocolate that we're using. Uh, the invert sugar is sweetening, but also um, increasing that water binding capability, uh, which again is really important for shelf life. Does everybody know where invert sugar comes from? Um, to understand invert sugar, it helps to understand regular granulated sugar, sucrose, a little bit better. Sucrose is a kind of a complex sugar that we would refer to as a disaccharide, meaning two sugars. So a, a, a molecule of sucrose is actually a chemical bond of one molecule of glucose and one molecule of fructose. And that chemical bond gives sugar all the properties that we know and love sugar for. It's sweetness, it's water binding potential, it's crystallization properties. But there's a process called hydrolysis. It's basically cooking sugar, water, and an acid um, that will essentially break apart those two molecules. And the result is invert sugar, a paste of roughly 20% water and then the remaining 80% is equal parts glucose and fructose. It has those anti-crystallization properties, but it also binds water a little bit more efficiency, which is why we're using it here. But interestingly, it also gets about 25% sweeter than the sucrose that it was made from is, which is kind of, kind of interesting. A lot of different ways we could produce this ganache. What I've done is I simply poured the hot cream over our white chocolate. And in this case, I'm using some white chocolate that has a lower sugar content to begin with, which will hopefully help the flavor of our ganache. I'm just gonna pour it over. I'm gonna let it sit for a moment, and then we're gonna hit it with an immersion blender. Uh, the yogurt flavor, uh, yogurt as an ingredient, whole yogurt would probably curdle if we tried to heat it up, uh, and it has a very, very high moisture content, which would work against us in something like a ganache. So we're actually going to add that sort of yogurt tang with a uh, yogurt powder. And we can really control uh, that yogurt flavor. We're also boosting our shelf life and our solids content. All right, so I'm gonna just hit this with the immersion blender. I think I plugged it. Chef Matt, is there anything I need to know about this blender? Is there a separate button I have to push? No. Okay. Try the other one? Yeah, try the other one. No? Okay. Plan B. There's one on the other side. That's fine. 
wonder if it's, um, did you have more than one plug in the same time? Nope. Then let's get the other binder. Yes. So what's happening is we're blending this ganache. Well, again, let's think about what's in the what's in this mixture. We have uh, chocolate, which is now melted chocolate. In the case, case of white chocolate, it is uh, sugar. Uh, we have milk solids. We have milk fat. Uh, plus, we have a lot of cocoa butter. About 30% of that white chocolate is cocoa butter fat. And then we added a bunch of cream, which is 36% fat. By blending, by creating that shear, what we're doing is we're taking all those now liquid fat particles, because they're, they're hot, right? And we're breaking them up into smaller particles, and we're evenly dispersing them, and that's gonna give us a more stable emulsion, which a ganache is an emulsion, uh, but it's also gonna give us a smoother, creamier mouthfeel. If we were just to do this with a spatula, it's not to say it would be grainy, uh, but it wouldn't be as smooth and creamy as possible or as bulletproof an emulsion. And once it's thoroughly blended, it should almost have like, almost like an elastic quality to it. Because as we kind of perfect that emulsion, it's also getting more viscous, okay? Temperature is really important when we're working with ganache. Um, not only achieving a temperature to properly melt all that cocoa butter, but also in adding our other ingredients and depositing it into molds. So right now our temperature, and it's a very, this is like the smallest quantity of ganache we could, we could make practically. Um, our temperature is now down to about 35 Celsius, about 95 degrees Fahrenheit, which just happens to be the melting point of what? Milk fat, butter fat. And that's the point where I wanna add our butter. If I add it above that temperature, what's gonna happen? The milk fat's just gonna melt and when it re-solidifies, when it crystallizes again, those crystals could be large and kind of jagged and again, impact in a negative way our texture and consistency. So I have room temperature butter that at this temperature should just almost cream into the ganache rather than melting. I can also add my yogurt powder at this point. And then just to add a little bit more balance, a little acid from some fresh lemon, or we could use a, the lemon puree or a lime puree, but literally just a few grams. Just to add a little bit of acidic balance to the sweetness of the white chocolate. Okay, so now our temperature has probably dropped a couple degrees, yeah, about one degree. So we wanna allow our ganache to drop to about 86 degrees Fahrenheit, 30 degrees uh, Celsius before we deposit it into our mold. So we're just gonna let this kind of hang out and continue to cool. And then we will uh, we'll turn our attention to the casting of the molds. Uh, incidentally, this, this ganache works really well um, as a base for fruit purees. One of my favorites with this general proportion is a banana. If we were to take this, uh, remove the yogurt powder, remove the uh, lemon juice, 
and add about 30 to 40 grams of a banana puree and maybe five or 10 grams of a dark rum, like a really, really nice vanilla banana rum ganache. Okay, so when either you're being incredibly shy, which hopefully we'll get over in the next three hours, uh, but when I ask about chocolate work, very few people raise their hands. Um, so let's try it a different way, um, maybe a little bit more specific. How many of you um, temper chocolate on a regular basis? Like say at least once a week, once a month, once a year, okay. You're still gonna be shy, but how many of you hardly ever temper chocolate at all or have never tempered chocolate? Okay, so a few of you, and probably some people not being honest. So let's take a few minutes and we'll talk about the tempering process just because we're gonna go through those steps. What I've already done is, uh, just as a little decorative element, I've added a little swipe of colored cocoa butter to these polycarbonate molds. Um, I'm not a huge color guy, uh, when it comes to um, decorating bonbons, but I do like to incorporate some color, especially where it kind of calls out the flavor that's inside. Uh, so all I did is I just took some red and blue colored cocoa butter, warmed them up, kept them in temper because they also have to be in temper, and then just combined them to make sort of a purple color that kind of replicates the color of the black currant itself. Okay. Gave that a little swipe into clean, polished, partly carbonate molds. And we're gonna give the rest of the shell uh, a layer of white chocolate. So I have some white chocolate here that's been completely melted and it's just been kind of sitting in a, in a cool spot. When we uh, Temper chocolate, I actually, I, I've been trying to train myself to stop using the word temper because people tend to fixate on temperature, which is important, but it's not everything when it comes to working with chocolate. When we temper chocolate, what are we doing? We're actually pre-crystallizing it, okay? Um, so the first step in pre-crystallizing our chocolate is actually to melt it, but melting it to a certain degree so that all of the possible um, solid cocoa butter crystals have completely melted, so we're starting from a clean slate. I'm gonna continue to talk about this as I, as I work on it. So the chocolate was initially heated to about 115 degrees Fahrenheit. It's white chocolate, so the temperatures are a little bit more uh, delicate than dark chocolate. Dark chocolate we could heat to about 120. But I've just been keeping a warm spot, so it's cooled slightly. I'm pouring about two thirds of this chocolate onto a marble. Marble's always cool to the touch, right? So as it comes into contact with the marble, as I move it around the surface of the marble, what's happening? The temperature is dropping. So let's consider cocoa butter for a second. Cocoa butter comes from a cocoa bean. The cocoa bean is a seed of a fruit. I'm sure here in uh, the islands, you're all familiar with fresh cocoa pods or have at least been exposed to them once or twice. But what I'm kind of starting to drive at is that cocoa butter is a plant-based fat. Most plant-based fats are what at room temperature? Liquid, canola oil, olive oil, sesame oil, et cetera. But there are a few exceptions, some tropical plants produce fats that are solid at room temperature. Coconut, palm kernel, cocoa. So that's already kind of an interesting thing. And then cocoa butter, the fat in the cocoa bean, can actually be a solid in many different ways. Typically we say six different crystal formations that cocoa butter can take. We would call that being polymorphic, many shapes. Only one of those crystal forms will give us the shine, the snap, the resistance to melting that we look for in a chocolate bar or a bonbon. So this tempering or <clears throat> pre-crystallization process is what's gonna give us that ideal crystal formation. Typically we call that number five of those six. 
So the first step was taking a portion of our, or heating the entire amount of chocolate to decrystallize it. And then by taking a portion of it, roughly two thirds, and cooling it very rapidly with agitation, we created a lot of those stable crystals. However, and we brought the temperature down to about 82 degrees Fahrenheit. However, we also created a lot of unstable crystals, some type three, some type four. By adding the cooled chocolate back to the warm chocolate, we raise the overall temperature, ideally up to about 86 to 88 degrees for white chocolate. And in that process, we melt out all of those unstable crystals and regulate the number of stable crystals. There's no way any of us can measure this in any kitchen setup that most of us would have. So you have to take my word for it. But no matter how we temper chocolate, whether it's tabling, seeding, uh, a machine, how many of us actually have tempering machines? Okay, a few of us. Uh, back in the lab, I have a 50 uh, pound, 24 kilo capacity, which I love. Um, but no matter how we temper the chocolate, our, our properly tempered chocolate at working temperature will have roughly 1% stable crystals. 1% of our cocoa butter is in that stable form. And then as our chocolate bar sets, or our shelf, or our bonbon sets, the rest of the cocoa butter crystals will mimic that stable crystal form. I think I just tried to explain tempering in four minutes. Um, it's one of those things you can explain in four minutes or four hours. But I do a lot of uh, historical research into chocolate making. Um, my, my lab back at the school in New York, my home base, my office is a bean-to-bar chocolate lab. Um, so I've been doing a lot of historical research in connection with that. You know, you can find lots of um, important moments in the evolution of chocolate, like, uh, you know, the, cocoa, the invention of the cocoa butter press, the uh, um, development of milk chocolate, the invention of the conch, does anyone know who invented, invented the conching machine? A guy named Rudolf Lint. A name we don't necessarily associate with super high quality, but in the 1880s, the conching machine was like a huge leap forward in refined textures and flavors of chocolate. But the one thing I never found was a very specific person or moment in chocolate history where Voila, we figured out, we, we, we totally understand chocolate tempering. Because I started looking at textbooks from about 100, 120 years ago, like kind of manufacturing texts about the chocolate process. And the temperatures they use are way off, like 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Now granted, they used metal molds up until about the middle of the 20th century. So I think the metal pulling more heat away from the chocolate probably compensated for that a little bit. But I imagine in the 1890s, most chocolate was probably a little bloomed because the tempering process wasn't completely figured out. <clears throat> I can't give you two cases of free, free puree, but any of you guesses as to when the way we temper chocolate today, when that was really, really finely understood? The 1950s, um, which is really recent. <laughs> Uh, but our understanding of tempering has just been a slow, sort of cumulative process of, of gaining knowledge and understanding, which I think is fascinating. Okay, um, to keep my molds clean, because I hate cleaning chocolate molds, I'm, and of course, in like a, a, an academic chocolate lab, I'm not doing any production by any means, so I can work really inefficiently. I'm gonna actually deposit my chocolate with a pastry bag. Obviously in this case, we also want that cocoa butter decor that we either spray or swipe or brush in to be completely set. And if our chocolate is at the proper working temperature, we won't mar the, the detail of that. 
almost perfect plus there. Yeah, my problem with coming to the islands is <clears throat> I'm always so busy, both before and after, that I'm an idiot. I'd never carve enough time to just hang out. So both of these last two trips, I'm like, I'm going to go to a cocoa farm on the North Shore or another island, and it never pans out because I don't afford myself enough time. But next time. All right, so I'm going to drain out the excess. Again, our goal is a thin and brittle shell as thin as possible. So I'm going to knock out as much of this excess as I can. I'm just going to let these crystallize. They should, it's really nice, perfect working conditions in here. Pastry kitchens should always be cold, right? So th these should crystallize relatively quickly. And then we'll deposit our blackcurrant gel and our yogurt ganache. Sometimes instead of inverting these and letting these set this way, I'll kind of stand them upright and every few minutes just rotate them 90 degrees just to maintain an even thickness around the edge. I'm going to go ahead and check our temperature of our ganache. So we want to bring this down to about 86 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm at 88, so almost perfect timing here. So we'll get this into a bag. It's always ideal to have our shell ready and waiting for our ganache rather than the other way around. Because ideally we want the ganache to be deposited the moment we hit the, our ideal temperature where it's at its most fluid and the most stable emulsion. Here's a quiz for you. What happens if, uh, for whatever reason, because sometimes, you know, a recipe might be solid, but what if the person who wrote the recipe is using a chocolate that has, say, less cocoa butter than the chocolate that we're using in our own kitchen? What's going to happen in that case? We have perhaps too much fat for the water that's in our cream, the water that's in our ganache, and it breaks. And we have a grainy, broken ganache. How do we fix that? We have a broken ganache. What's, what's the first thing that we tend to do? What's that? Heating it back up, but do we ever add anything more to it? More cream? That's actually the worst thing to add because when we add more cream, what are we adding? We're adding more fat. It sounds counterintuitive because we always, we're, we're always talking about controlling water in our ganache. Um, but actually adding a few drops of water will actually bring our ganache back to a more stable emulsion. Sounds counterintuitive, but that's actually the best thing to add. All right, let's give these shells one more minute. While we do that, let's move on to um, talk about our marshmallow. Actually, we'll, we'll, we'll go back a little bit, and, and when we're talking about um, kind of composition of our recipes. 
know, if we think about it, most of our ingredients, most of us, are made of what? Water. So a lot of cooking is simply controlling water. Either we're trying to get rid of it, we're trying to hold on to it, we're trying to change its nature. Um, when we bake puff pastry, what's going to leaven our puff pastry? It's little tiny droplets of water that turn from liquid to steam. What do we do when we make ice cream or sorbet? We're turning liquid water into super, super, super tiny ice crystals. At least that's the goal. Um, so a lot of cooking is controlling water when it really comes down to it. A really important question to ask yourself is what can be water? Um, considering that maybe this is an odd way to sell a, a fruit puree, but a fruit puree is mostly water. I mean, when you get right down to it. But again, the great thing about the Boiron purees is we can tell you exactly how much water is in it because all the fruit purees have a, a, a bricks content on the packaging, uh, which is super, super helpful for uh, formulation, whether we're talking about ganaches or confections or sorbet or ice cream. Really, really important knowledge to have. But it's important to ask yourself, well, what can be water? So in the case of our marshmallows, how would we typically create a marshmallow? Uh, we would have uh, a sugar syrup consisting of water, sugar, glucose. Uh, we would cook that to a certain temperature. We would pour it over um, a bunch of gelatin. Sometimes we incorporate egg whites. But what's the most difficult thing to do with a marshmallow is flavor it, unless we're using an extract or a concentrate or something that isn't going to really have flavors that are true to nature. So the idea with this uh, Lilikoi um, marshmallow is to get flavor into it using the purees. So you know, asking yourself what can be water? Well, why not substitute some, if not all, of the water in our sugar syrup for passion fruit puree? So that's what we did with the, uh, the marshmallow. Let's fast forward here. We'll talk a little bit about gelatin while we look at this as well. Since we talked about pectin from a technical perspective, sometimes it's helpful to kind of get a refresher on gelatin, even though it's something we use probably every day. Where does gelatin come from? It typically comes from a bovine or porcine source, which is shorthand for cows or pigs. Doesn't come from horse hooves or anything nefarious like that. Comes from the hides and the bones. There is a fish gelatin. Has anyone ever used fish-based gelatin? Um, I know of a couple uh, pastry shops back in New York that exclusively use fish gelatin, which gives them kosher certification, which can be important. Um, but it works a little bit differently. You have to change some of the formulas a little bit, um, but essentially works the same. I don't use it that often. But how would we describe the texture of something set with gelatin? It's a long texture, and it's chewy, it's elastic, it's extendable, um, which is why it's one of the hardest things to substitute for. I'm often asked the question, can I substitute agar for gelatin? And the answer is usually yes, but no. You can, you're not going to get anything like the effect that gelatin will give you, but you can have something slightly different. But because of, you know, its expense, because of uh, dietary restrictions, you know, we're often trying to struggle to find alternatives for gelatin. But even as, a, as an ice cream stabilizer, up until about 50 years ago, gelatin was a sort of default ice cream stabilizer. Why? Because it melts at body temperature. So as we're eating something, that's also what makes it so pleasant to, to eat, is that as we're chewing, it melts, and, and the product, whatever it is, becomes softer. Its setting point, you usually think of gelatin-based things as being cold, but their, its setting point is actually a cool room temperature of about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. 
And then how do we work with it? We hydrate it in water to soften it, and then we add it to something hot, it dissolves, we let it cool, it sets. Gelatin's pretty straightforward. I think there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> things that sometimes people don't understand about gelatin. So by show of hands, how many of you regularly use uh, gelatin powder? Almost nobody. Gelatin sheets. Okay. Uh, you can just yell it out. What grade of sheet do you use? Bronze, silver, gold? That I hear mostly silver? Is that because you all order it from the same, same place? <laughs> Which is often the case. You get what your supplier sells. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, a lot of people don't understand is that when you're working with sheet gelatin, I lost my sheet, but um, a sheet is a sheet. Whether it's bronze, silver, gold, platinum exists, I've never used it, but it's out there. A sheet is a sheet no matter what. It's because even though these different grades have different what we call bloom strength, each grade is a different weight. So for example, a sheet of gold gelatin, generally speaking, its bloom strength is 200. All you need to know about that number is the higher it is, the firmer it is, versus a sheet of bronze, which has a lower bloom strength, but if you look at the weight per sheet, they're very different, two grams versus three grams. There are very few gelatin manufacturers in the world, but they've kind of gotten together to come up with this kind of standardized system where a sheet is a sheet. So you can imagine it come, we come into difficulties when um, we see a recipe, and sometimes it happens, probably with good intention, is that someone will say 10 grams of gelatin sheets. Now you understand, it makes a huge difference what kind of grade they're talking about. If they say 10 grams of gold gelatin sheets, okay, I, I, I can understand that. But if it just says 10 grams of gelatin sheets, you see now how 10 grams of bronze, that's like three sheets versus five sheets of gold. One of those is gonna set a lot firmer than the other one. So we'll figure out a way to get this to you. Actually, if you wanna bring me a business card at the end, I'll, I'll send it to you directly or we can send it through you through somebody, uh, send it to you through somebody at Waihata. Um, I'll, I'll send this information to you because it's, it's, it's really great to have. There's a very complicated conversion we could do um, to convert from one type of gelatin to another. But I went ahead and did all the work for you. This is every possible conversion you would ever have to make if you were jumping back and forth between sheet, powder, gelatin, between different grades. What's that? I did. You're welcome. Um, yeah, very, very, very useful. I use it all the time. Because also, you know, I used to write recipes for like, you know, Bon Appetit magazine or Food and Wine magazine, and I would always have to convert my gelatin sheets to powder because that's apparently what home cooks had access to. And I was always doing like, I think one sheet is equal to a teaspoon of powder or whatever. And you, you realize now when you look at this how flawed that thinking is. So you can get a lot more specific <coughs> uh, using this chart. Okay, we're gonna go back to our bonbons, but let's just uh, finish up with the, uh, the marshmallow here. I'll just cut a little bit to show you. I made this yesterday, because it does take several hours to set. But again, procedure-wise, we substituted half of our water in our sugar syrup for the passion fruit puree. I'm sure you've all had this one before, but we'll give you one to taste as well. I mean, you have such amazing passion fruit here in the islands, but again, the great thing about the puree is that it's always gonna be consistent. And it also saves a little bit of labor, of course. Yeah, yeah, you might not wanna just knock it back unless you have some sort of chaser. <laughs> Uh, but this is one of about half of the purees in the line that within the last few years 
uh, they've completely taken out all the added sugar. Uh, so whenever you see 100% on the package, uh, that means there's no added sugar in the, the, the manufacturing process. Um, and that, Voiron has never added a blanket amount of sugar, which, which some other puree companies will just add 10% no matter what. Um, as I was mentioning before, there's a standard, a standard flavor, a standard bricks level, a standard acidity, and sugar was only ever added to achieve that. Um, but technological advances have allowed them to create, again, roughly half the line is 100%, which is sometimes good for you know, particular businesses that, that want to control the sugar a little bit more. But again, even with that no added sugar, we still have that technical information. We can tell you exactly how much natural sugar is in it. So when we're uh, producing ice creams and sorbets, that becomes really important. Uh, another interesting thing about the, uh, the marshmallow is that I'm not using any cornstarch and confectioner sugar, which I just think is messy. Um, it was simply poured out onto a piece of uh, plastic film and the caramel rulers with a little bit of pan spray. Uh, and here I did use powdered gelatin because it, it allows me to control how much water is hydrated a lot more. We actually measure the water that the gelatin is hydrated in. Sometimes sheets are preferable. Sometimes I like um, for something where it has to be really dialed in, like the marshmallow or the gummy bear that we're gonna look at in a little bit, um, I prefer powder. I did spray it with a little bit of pan spray, but I wiped most of it off. And that's the one thing I always worry about is humidity uh, when making this stuff, but the environment at least since I've been here, has been perfect. I think I've been dodging rain every island I go to. Uh, and again, not using cornstarch and powdered sugar. I'm using dextrose as the sugar, just to kind of coat it to keep it from sticking to your, yourself or each other. Dextrose is about 75% the sweetness of regular sucrose. And it's also a much finer powder. Does anyone use like a, like snow sugar? What's the, what's the brand that Y Hot has? Arctic something? Arctic snow. Arctic snow. That's mostly dextrose. So it doesn't. It has a. Um, it's less hygroscopic. It's less. It, it absorbs much less moisture. Um, so that's what keeps it from melting. But it also has a very 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 slight what we call a cooling effect. So I find when we're flavoring the marshmallows with a fruit flavor, it kind of amplifies that fruit flavor with that slight cooling effect. But they're like super, super light and fluffy. I also like to kind of, again, temperature is often highly underrated when we're cooking. Um, or, or maybe not when we're cooking, but um, should always be thinking about temperatures at every step of the process. It might be a better way of saying that. Um, because, you know, in the whipping process, there's a, there's a curve. Uh, the more we whip as it cools down, the, the marshmallow mixture will aerate, right? And then there's a point where it's going to have the maximum volume, and then at one point, it's also going to start to knock air out of it, just like whipped cream or ice cream. Um, you know, once we start to over whip whipped cream, we're actually knocking air out of it. So... I find that right around 80 degrees Fahrenheit is when I actually stop the whipping process. It's still slightly warm to the touch, or the bowl is slightly still warm to the touch. And I find that that gives us both maximum aeration, the fluffiest marshmallow possible, but it's also soft enough that we can, we can pour it into a frame and spread it without it just making a mess as well. And again, we're gonna taste this stuff. I'm just gonna kinda try to do that all towards the end. So let's go back to our bonbon. Our shells are set. Our ganache is going to be at perfect temperature. Yes. So you, you could, there, there's a couple different ways. You could temper it in like a conventional way, which usually we're talking about such a small amount that that's impractical. Um, 
There is heating it up to the point where it's melted, but it's never, never goes out of temper. So I, I, you know, I know people that will use things like a yogurt maker, which you can really dial in the temperatures like in the 90 degree range. Um, and you could just warm it really slowly and something like that. You could use something called micronized cocoa butter to melt and then adding 1% to temper. I have a really interesting device back in the lab that's an incubator that will hold cocoa butter at a very, very precise temperature, like exactly 33 or, uh, yeah, 33.6 or 90, 2.5 degrees Fahrenheit, and it, it gives you like a creamy consistency to the cocoa butter, but it's pure stable crystal. So you can just add that. So I do that a lot. Or to be honest with you, the way I did it this morning, so I popped these guys into the microwave to they were about half melted and then just shook. So I was in a sense seeding with the portion that didn't melt. That's the highly technical way. <laughs> A great question, because a lot of people don't understand, like, yeah, that has to be in temper as well. Often the, another fault or you know, mistake that occurs, especially when we do something like this where we're applying it with a brush or a fingertip, is we actually create a little bit of friction and we can actually take that cocoa butter into an over-tempered phase and that's where the, the cocoa butter decor will tend to stick to the mold and not release. That might be a different class though, is getting into the, the specifics of cocoa butter crystallization. But once, once we have tempered it and we maintain that temperature, we also need to be careful not to over crystallize it in the application process. So again, just to reiterate, we started with a very firm pot de fouille like texture, and now we have a very soft, pipeable texture with our black currant gel. I'm sorry, what was the question? Great question. Uh, yes. And it's really temperature dependent. So it happens once you get to its setting point or colder. That's why we were able to achieve this when it was, I mean, I made, I made this, quite frankly, the base for this back in New York before I left and brought it with me. Um, but it's been sitting at room temperature since then because there's enough sugar. It won't, go, uh, it won't grow bacteria. Um, but while it's hot, before it hits that setting temperature, we can stir it all day long to no ill effect. Anticipating maybe the root of the question though, different types of pectin. There are two general different types of pectin. We, again, I don't wanna to get too far into a chemistry lesson, but one would be what's called low methoxyl pectin, which is what we're using here for jams, jellies, pot de fouilles. And then there's something called high methoxyl pectin. I'm sorry. This is high methoxyl pectin, low methoxyl pectin, is often known as pectin NH. And that sets completely differently. That will set more in the presence of certain uh, minerals like calcium. But it also has very different textural properties. And NH pectin has the ability for thermal reversibility. So often we use pectin NH and things like neutral glazes, things that we can heat up and it'll set and we can melt it down and heat it up and with, with no ill effect. Like that's typically the, the gelling agent used in things like neutral glaze. But they are both um, shear thinning to a certain degree. So because I'm piping this ganache right at its ideal temperature, it's still soft and fluid enough that I can fill it almost to the top, allowing a little place for the sealing to take place. But also, might take a little bit of a tap, but I have a perfectly flat surface instead of a rounded surface. If I let the ganache cool too long, 
I'll have, have either a rounded surface or I'll have that little like Hershey's kiss effect, which can become a little bit annoying when we go to seal the bonbon. In a perfect world, we would let these crystallize for several hours at room temperature. I think they're gonna kick me out of here by like 2.30, and you also have, probably have to go back to work, right? So we're gonna actually rely a little bit on some refrigeration to kind of move these along. But again, I avoid putting any chocolate application into refrigeration if I can absolutely avoid it because we're, we're working with, um, we're dealing with condensation issues. <clears throat> chocolate doesn't like to be bossed around. It likes to do things on its own timeline. But if we're, if we're careful, we can use the, the refrigerator to, to set things a little bit more quickly. Do you ever use a mold inhibitor? I'm sorry? Do you ever use a mold inhibitor? A mold inhibitor, uh, describe what you mean by that. If it's a liquid that prevents mold that you would add to it? Do you know what it's made up of? So the sodium base. Huh, I haven't used it. I imagine that that would probably increase shelf life significantly. You know, again, for most of us, we're probably not worried about creating a bonbon that will last for three, four months. Um, so we can really push water content, we can push soft textures. You know, but uh, you know, commercial bonbons, like it's a lot of math that goes into the formulation to achieve that shelf life and also maintain, you know, low sweetness and soft textures. You know, without naming names, think of like the cheapest box assortment chocolate you can. You know, chances are the textures are very firm and the, uh, the taste is very sweet, but that thing probably has a year shelf life. You know, a high-end chocolatier is gonna compromise shelf life in service of flavor and less sweetness. I'm sorry? Yeah, that, that's just a little bit of cut and pasting from a couple of my own recipe sources. Um, yellow pectin is just a very specific type of, uh, of, of pectin, apple pectin. Um, they're, they're, they could be used almost interchangeably. What we really want to look for if, if our suppliers have it on the packaging is that setting point, whether it's slow, fast, or medium. And for most applications, we want a medium or a slow set. Okay, so I'm just gonna let these hang out at room temp. <clears throat> Speaking of our pectin, by now our pot de fouille is probably ready to go. The other thing we can do to control uh, the sweetness of our pot de fouille is to incorporate a little bit of acid. I like to do about one to 2% of citric acid or tartaric acid or malic acid mixed in with our sugar that we're using to coat. And that will give us a slight like Sour Patch Kid effect. I'm just gonna eyeball about 1%. Uh, one question that I often get uh, when it comes to acids like that, citric, tartaric, malic, you know, what are the differences? I said, I, I think if you, once it's added to something, if you can taste the difference, you probably have superhuman sensory abilities. Um, whether we use citric acid or tartaric acid in the pot de fouille, it's gonna lower the pH to the same degree and you would not taste a difference. <clears throat> 
sometimes with these 3D molds, it takes a little bit of massaging to get it out. There we go. I really like this mold for the pot de fouille. Again, that little bit of citric acid, one to 2% will, to some degree, balance the sweetness. We're gonna look at one more thing before we take just a short break, just so you guys can get up, move around. I can stage some some other things. We're going to look at um, the calamansi apricot gummy, which is a fun one. I'll let you taste the calamansi. This is extremely potent. Did, did everybody know that Boiron does a yuzu puree? Yeah. It's amazing, it's amazing. Um, far better than the, the bottled variety that most of us are kind of stuck with. So interesting thing about gummies is uh, I don't know that there are any commercial gummy bears that are made with fruit puree. Uh, they're all made with concentrates, with extracts and flavorings like that. So this was a bit of a, again, a, a formulation challenge to get fresh fruit flavors into <coughs> a gummy bear, <coughs> yet still maintain that desirable kind of chewy consistency. But we figured it out. So what we have is a combination of the calamansi puree, uh, which you're tasting, which is a, a, a variety of lime from the Philippines. You, you can come up with your own descriptor, but when people ask me what it tastes like, I don't know, it's, it's a more floral lime, uh, more complex. Um, some people suggest that it's maybe lime crossed with more aromatic citrus like tangerine or, or mandarin. Um, but it, it, it's a great base ingredient. We're combining that with a little apricot puree. Uh, the apricot puree is there less for flavor and more for the fact that it's bringing some natural pectin to the party. Because we're using fruit purees, we're gonna actually get some additional textural benefits from the natural pectin uh, in the apricot. And, and you probably have seen this as well sometimes with pot de fouille, um, fruits that are low in natural pectin will require the addition of an apple puree or pear puree or apricot puree, something that in relation to the, to the main flavor is fairly neutral, but brings a lot of natural pectin so we get the right balance uh, texturally. So that's, that's the purpose for the apricot puree, but I've also used pear. Because the calamansi is so intense, um, you're not gonna taste really any of the apricot in here. It's gonna be pure calamansi. We've combined this with sucrose, with glucose, as well as a couple other sugars like dextrose and sorbitol. Um, if you don't have sorbitol in your shop, you can totally make this. Just replace it with more sucrose and it'll be fine. The sorbitol just helps fine tune uh, the moisture retention, uh, adding a lower sweetening power, but it'll certainly work if it's substituted just with more sugar. <clears throat> 
uh, and the dextrose as well. We don't always have dextrose on hand. We could substitute some glucose powder um, and they'll have a similar effect. <coughs> We're gonna cook this up to about the soft ball stage, 240 degrees Fahrenheit. And then what we have here is, again, using powdered gelatin, so I can really um, dial in how much water we've used to hydrate that gelatin in, as well as some glucose. And again, it's not reflected in the recipe, but actually some of my water, I added some additional calamansi to it. What can be water? Why not some more calamansi? Sometimes they get the gelatin, a little head start uh, in terms of melting while the, the sugar syrup or the calamansi syrup, I should say, is coming up. I'll uh, just start to warm the gelatin a little bit. We are gonna be pouring a 240 degree syrup over the top of it, so that gelatin is gonna dissolve. But I'll give it just a little bit of a head start. Uh, how are most um, gummy type candies uh, produced? Um, they're often made using what's called, what are called starch molds. Has anyone ever tried that, starch molding? It's a really messy process like in a pastry shop. Um, but imagine large trays filled with starch, like cornstarch. Uh, they're often mixed with a, a small amount of oil. So when you press in a positive form, um, it'll give you a very accurate relief of that <clears throat> uh, in that starch bed. So when I've done this on my own, I've taken some cornstarch, you have to dry it out in the oven a little bit. So uh, it's not too wet. And then I just take some old stale gummy bears that have hardened and I uh, glued them to a ruler and you just press that into the starch. And the, the form of the gummy bear will be embedded into the starch. So our final temperature here is 240 degrees. Because I hate making a mess, <clears throat> in lieu of uh, starch molds, you can pass that around. I found little silicone gummy molds. <clears throat> Actually, Chef, would you mind uh, cleaning out the dropper for me? Yes, proof that you can find <clears throat> virtually anything on the internet now. The other challenge <clears throat> in flavoring a gummy bear, which is set with a lot of gelatin, is gelatin is protein, right? Um, protein can actually inhibit our ability to perceive flavors. So that's why often these, these gummy candies have, um, you know, intense flavorings added to them uh, because the, the protein kind of works against us. So I find that this does work best with the uh, super intense purees like calamansi, yuzu, passion fruit, uh, lime, but it could be made with virtually any puree. I, I couldn't even tell you all the, the variations I've, I've made with this recipe using <clears throat> mango, raspberry, strawberry, etc. All right, we are up to our 240 Fahrenheit. We're simply just gonna pour this over that hydrated gelatin. And we're gonna have a instinctive tendency to wanna to whisk this. Uh, but the more we whisk it and incorporate air, the more air bubbles we're gonna get into the mixture. So I actually just give it a little bit of time, stir it really gently with a spatula, that gelatin will dissolve. We're also adding a little bit of citric acid to this as well, which serves a couple purposes. It not only 
gives us a little bit more of that acidic flavor to balance the sugar, but it's also activating that natural pectin in the apricot. And once that gelatin is dissolved, we're ready to go. I also, you know, I never really, I had this mold for years and years and I never really did anything with it until I started making the gummies. <clears throat> I realized how cool I could make like little stylized worms. So I'm sure at, you know, all the properties that we work at, we never see kids, right? <laughs> These gummies can be kind of fun to play with for like a kind of a playful, nostalgic amenity. As soon as we get our, our dropper back here, I'll, uh, I'll deposit these. These do take some time. I often will let these sit in the molds for minimum 12 to 24 hours. Because even once, given the temperature of the, the sugar syrup, which removes a lot of the water, uh, they still need some uh, time to dry out. So I find one to two days, depending again on the, the humidity of the environment. Um, even when they're out of the mold, I'll give them a day to kind of dry out to get that kind of chewy, classic texture, at least that we associate with commercial gummy bears. Thank you so much. It was set pretty good. What's that? It was set pretty good. You know, thinking about the, the worms here, you know how you can go on the internet and kind of get lost on a rabbit hole. I uh, saw a reference once to, you know, fishermen that are so serious about their craft that they actually make their own fishing lures. So I started to do some research and there are companies that make very, very anatomically precise, correct, bugs and worms and things like that. And uh, if you wanted to produce very anatomically correct bugs with, <coughs> as a gummy candy, those molds are out there because they actually you know, make those with a soft silicone that starts off liquid like this and sets. Um, I haven't gone down that, that road yet, but eventually I will. The molds can get quite expensive though. Who's here for the evil nodder? Presentation. He makes his own molds. All the ones he used were homemade. It was really impressive. That's your I'm always living in Awald Nutter's shadow. No, no, whenever I come here, whenever I come here, I've been here twice. Um, but I think a couple of years before I came here the first time, um, I was sent just to kind of get a sense of the space. Uh, I was sent a a video of the, the demonstration that Awald Nader did. And I think he did a showpiece, right? Yeah. From start to finish. Um, you know, and the challenge of like in a demo, shortened time, you know, confined space is like tempering the chocolate, keeping it warm. And he actually used, he had a, a different rationale at the, at the time, right? Um, but you know, with ovens today, they can be dialed in precisely. He literally just put bowls of chocolate in the oven and they were in there for several hours, but they like tempered perfectly and he held, he used the oven as a chocolate warming vessel, um, which, so I think whenever I think of Ewald, I think of that, that trick. So obviously, we're not coming back tomorrow to check on these. Um, you know, but I made some of these a couple days ago. You know, what we're looking for once they're properly dried is that kind of chewy, bouncy consistency. If we, if we unmold these right away, they're gonna be more like soft jello, so they do need to dry out a little bit. And then in terms of coating them, 
You'll see in the recipe, I, I suggest uh, grapeseed oil and an optional carnauba wax. That's what they would use commercially. Um, but carnauba wax is really hard to work with in a small quantity. It's basically a wax that has a very high melting point, so it's hard to keep it liquid. Um, so I rarely use it. I use a, literally for one recipe, two or three drops of uh, grapeseed oil. Grapeseed oil because it's neutral, and that's enough to lubricate them and keep them from sticking to kind of seal in uh, some of the moisture. The other thing that I'll do is utilize um, a flavored oil. So with these, I actually, to, to kind of mirror the calamansi, I use an orange zest oil. Uh, again, just a couple drops to kind of, again, anything that we can do to preserve flavor, add a little bit of flavor. How would we make a, uh, <clears throat> a classic soft caramel? We would start with sugar. We would caramelize it. We would add to that cream, probably some glucose, and then we'd cook that to a final temperature. There are two ways that that classic caramel is gonna be getting flavor. Uh, one way is through the caramelization itself, of course. The other way we're getting flavor into that caramel is that as it cooks its way up to its final temperature, and again, we're cooking it to a temperature that will give us the texture and consistency and just the right amount of stickiness that we're looking for. As it works its way up to that temperature, it's also developing flavor. How many of you are familiar with um, a term, uh, Maillard reactions? It's actually what produces browning and flavor creation in most cooked food. What's the word we often use when talking about browning in food? Caramelization. Most of the time, nothing is truly caramelizing. It's really these Maillard reactions. So maybe it'll help us define what caramelization is. Caramelization is essentially when sugars are heated to a certain temperature and they start to break down and decompose. Um, and what do I mean by break down and decompose? Uh, imagine this is a sucrose molecule. Once I heat this to about 320 degrees, it's essentially as if I were gonna smash it against the surface of the table. Caramelization is this sucrose molecule shattered into hundreds of little pieces. We experience that, those shattered pieces as the flavor of caramel. I mean, how do we describe that? It's bitter, it's buttery, it's nutty, it's caramelly, right? Um, that's caramelization. Most browning in food happens at a much lower temperature and is due to proteins and sugars and heat and loss of water and those are those Maillard reactions. <clears throat> so, named after a French guy, Louis Camille Maillard. Um, <clears throat> he discovered them not that long ago, relatively speaking, only about 100 years ago. And he wasn't really looking at food so much as other aspects of chemistry. But what he discovered is that when you have protein or amino acids, the building blocks of protein, you have certain types of sugar, the simple sugars like glucose, fructose, lactose, even ribose, the sugar in muscles. When you have an increase of temperature combined with a loss of water, at a certain point you get brown colors and the creation of flavor compounds that didn't exist before. So think about what we call caramelized onions. That's a great example of what's truly Maillardized onions. There are proteins and sugars in the onions when we heat them up, moisture evaporates and they eventually turn brown and the flavor completely changes. I don't think it's gonna catch on if we start calling them Maillardized onions, but that would be great if it did. Um, so that classic caramel is not only getting caramel flavor from true caramelization, but because we're using cream, which has protein in it, and we have lactose and we have glucose in there, um, we also get that second little boost of flavor as the mixture cooks its way up to its final cooking temperature. Because these Maillard reactions happen much lower, like 230, 240 degrees. Except, what if we didn't want those, those flavors? Usually when we're, we're cooking, we're, we're trying to get browning, we're trying to get intensity of flavor. 
what if we were trying to sidestep those, those Maillard reactions and, and actually caramelization? Um, this idea for this fruit-based caramel started uh, with the acquisition of this funky looking machine, uh, which is a vacuum cooker. Uh, most of us don't have this technology in our kitchens because it requires all kinds of vacuum pumps and condensers and things like that. But basically cooking under a vacuum is the opposite of a pressure cooker. A pressure cooker is creating positive pressure where the boiling point is increased or the boiling point is raised rather. Negative pressure lowers the boiling point. How many of you, how many of you have ever cooked at like high altitude, like over 5,000 feet? You know that water boils like five or six degrees lower than at atmospheric pressure or that um, because of that, some of, our, um, some of our preparations get thrown out of whack because there's less pressure, water boils at a lower temperature, so things, weird things happen. When you can really decrease the pressure into negative territory, the boiling point can drop dramatically. So I acquired this um, vacuum cooker um, through the people that make um, all of our chocolate making equipment back in the lab. And it took me a while to kind of wrap my head around, well, what could I do with it? Um, and I started thinking, well, what's, what's the point of using you know, these purees and, and how do I often try to use them? It's about preserving flavor and maximizing, maximizing flavor. So often when I can, I actually avoid trying to cook them. So I preserve the flavor that they already offer or cooking them gently. Um, so I started thinking, well, if I can cook a caramel in a vacuum at a very low temperature, relatively speaking, I'm gonna preserve more of this fruit flavor and, and, and the color of the natural fruit. The caramel that we're gonna make, we're gonna take up to 245 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the final cooking temperature. I found that under negative pressure, 20 inches of mercury to be exact, I could get the same effect cooking to 190 degrees. That's like 40 degrees lower than any of those Maillard reactions that would occur at atmospheric pressure. So when I'm able to make it in a vacuum, it's like super bright and vibrant like a Starburst candy. Um, obviously, I didn't take that with me and you can't replicate it. So we're gonna cook this caramel at atmospheric pressure, uh, but we're gonna try to avoid those Maillard reactions and those typical caramel flavors. So in the pot, I have cream, glucose, sucrose, a little bit of invert sugar, a touch of salt, and raspberry puree. Again, this is one of those recipes. The base recipe is so simple, you could substitute virtually any puree. I've done white peach, mango, blackberry. I think the photo I just put up was a blackberry. Um, it works with anything. And instead of caramelizing the sugar first, everything went into the pot. And now we're gonna just cook it straight to 245 degrees. If we go back and look at this, you know, what's, what's needed for these Maillard reactions. Increase of pH isn't a necessity, but it can amplify these Maillard reactions. What's an example of increasing the pH in food to really amplify brown colors and, and, and flavors. Has anyone ever made pretzel anything? What's, what's the one component of a pretzel that makes it a pretzel? You're, you're treating it with some sort of alkaline. Could be something weak like baking soda, could be something strong like lye. By increasing the pH, by increasing the alkalinity, we get pretzel, which is Maillard reactions on steroids. So I started to think, I, I've, I've always added citric acid to this caramel at the end of the cooking process to kind of, again, preserve those fruity flavors. What happens if we add a little bit at the beginning? It actually lowers the pH. How many of you have ever baked a loaf of bread that maybe was over-fermented or over-proofed? It never browns as well as a properly fermented loaf, right? Because increased yeast activity increases acidity, 
and an increase in acidity or a lowering of pH will inhibit browning. So it made sense to me if I actually added some of the acid at the beginning of the process, I could avoid some of those, those Maillard flavors even more. So there's a little bit of the citric acid actually added at the beginning of the process. So I'm gonna cook this again to a final temperature of 245 Fahrenheit. We're gonna finish it with, again, a little bit more remaining citric acid and some cocoa butter. As we established, cocoa butter is a plant-based fat that's solid at room temperature, so it's gonna give us a little bit more body. It's gonna reduce the stickiness a little bit. Typically, I can let this go full, full blast on the heat right until about the time I hit about 2.30, and that's when I wanna stir a little bit more um, consistently because that's when we can get a little bit more opportunity to brown, in this case, scorch a little bit perhaps. My, my role at, um, at the school in New York, I'm not in the classroom every day, but uh, I teach three or four of my own classes every month. I obviously spend a lot of time making chocolate. I um, also do guest lectures for all of our pastry students. And I, I see them very early on in their, their process, actually the first week of their program, I waltz in and I give them a super scary technical lecture on dairy products. Composition of milk versus heavy cream versus butter and how cultured dairy products are made and all of this. Lots of technical information. And the purpose of that is not that they have to memorize that because I give them all these charts and they have it for life. Um, but it's really to think about ingredients in a new way. Because we brown butter. And once you understand that butter is water and fat and protein and lactose, and when we apply heat and we remove water, brown butter is also Maillard reactions. And then that helps us explain how baked goods with dairy products and then brown. Um, and then we also do a traditional soft caramel um, in that class as an exercise to kind of unite the dairy products with the Maillard reactions with some, with some uh, discussion of caramelization. And it's a, it's a great product that kind of distills all those concepts. So the frame that we're gonna pour this into A little 12 centimeter frame. This is the perfect amount for this, the recipe that's in the handout. <clears throat> it can of course be increased. But it took a lot of engineering so that this recipe perfectly fits this frame. So I often joke with the students, like I'm gonna know if you misscaled or you miscooked your caramel because it's either gonna be overflowing or underfilled. And I'm simply just gonna line this with a little bit of plastic wrap. The substitute the cream for uh, I haven't tried it, but actually the, the, you know, really the answer to that is to really look closely at the composition of say coconut milk or coconut puree um, with that of heavy cream. I would say they're, they're pretty close in terms of water and fat content. Um, you have different types of sugars, uh, which may tend to contribute to those Maillard reactions a little bit more, but, it's, but that's a great question even if I don't have the very specific answer for you, how do you find out? You, you gotta look at the composition. When you substitute one thing for another, you have to know what you're substituting. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you have to make an adjustment. I mean, I even talk about that too when it comes to things like, uh, you know, heavy cream comes in two fat contents. You have 36%, you have 40%. I uh, worked on a restaurant opening where all the ice creams and gelato were formulated for a 36% cream months before we ever walked into the kitchen. And then the day we walked into the kitchen, the walk-in is full of 40% cream. 
I had to pull back and whip out a calculator for a little bit and reformulate all the ice cream recipes to account for that subtle change in the cream, but 4% does make a big difference. So you just have to know what you're substituting for. And again, that's why I, I love the fact that we know the Brooks content um, of all the purees. So when we go from one puree to another in a sorbet or any other preparation, we, we kind of know how to adjust. We're adjusting for flavor and taste, but we can also adjust on a far more technical level too. So once I've reached my 245 degree Fahrenheit final cooking temperature, I cut the heat, I'm adding that cocoa butter. It's just gonna dissolve right in, or melt right in rather. Some citric acid, again, just to continue that, that brightness. And then right into the frame. And nothing left. So this is one also, we won't be able to do anything with this until tomorrow. So by the magic of television, I have the one that I made yesterday. Voila, this is now completely set up. So again, what's gonna determine in a caramel like this, what's gonna determine you see that beautiful red color, like we avoided all the browning, which is normally what we're going after. But here, more of that, that fruit flavor is gonna come through because we avoided all that browning. But what's gonna determine the final texture and consistency is twofold. It's the final cooking temperature, but also the formulation. The amount of what we call uh, interfering agents, which include the fat, the glucose, all the things are gonna interfere with the crystallization of the sucrose. Again, just a little bit of pan spray, just to keep things from sticking to each other. And because we're using a fruit puree, I sound like a broken record here, but we're taking advantage of natural pectin in the fruit. So that's also gonna enhance the, the texture. This is one I will find though, uh, depending on the time of year, depending on the relative humidity, I might adjust the cooking time slightly. You know, we're just coming out of winter time in, uh, in New York where it's very dry. I mean, sometimes the relative humidity is like 30% and we're going into a time of year when it feels like it's 130%. Uh, so sometimes in hot weather in the middle of summer, I might increase that final cooking temperature a degree or two to account for that. Yeah, I'm, ho I'm hoping uh, one day in the not too f distant future, somebody figures out how to produce these, uh, this vacuum cooking technology. Where'd it go? In a practical sense that we can all take advantage of. Because most, most commercial confectionery is done to some degree in a vacuum. So you can work around those those chemical reactions like caramelization and Maillard reactions. All right, so we're gonna come back to this guy. Next, we're gonna look at um, this cherry preserve and pistachio spread. We're not gonna spend a ton of time on it. 
but it got me thinking. I'm, I'm often, uh, well, one, one of my favorites, uh, by the way, raspberry puree. So you can taste it in its fresh form. One of my favorite chocolate products is uh, Janduja. Is everyone familiar with Janduja? Produced in Northern Italy. It's essentially a product where hazelnuts are ground into the cocoa beans as they're being ground into chocolate. One of my favorite things on the planet. And the people who aren't familiar with it, I try to describe it as kind of what Nutella wants to be. If anything, Nutella is sort of a, a lower brow version of what John Duya already is. So um, I love playing around with making things that are kind of similar, if not to the legal standard of John Duya, but making different fillings and spreads that are, um, that are close, but a little bit more inventive. So this pistachio spread is simply a combination of melted cocoa butter, uh, a little bit of uh, white chocolate, you could use milk chocolate, you could use dark chocolate. I called an audible uh, for this demo and I, I um, used a combination of actual janduya. And um, here at Chef Zone, they have this interesting uh, praline paste that has some little bits of like crunchy fouillotine in it, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting to add some texture. Um, but also pistachio paste. In this case, I'm using a blend of a sweetened pistachio paste with one that is pure unsweetened. Sometimes we have to make a, a decision when it comes to pistachio paste. Typically, we obviously want the flavor of pure unsweetened pistachio paste, but often the color is a little lacking because there's a consumer expectation that pistachio flavored things be green. I mean, hopefully not neon green, but sometimes we see those too, like macaroons that are like glow in the dark green. Um, but sometimes I, I achieve that compromise just by blending, you know, roughly 50% sweetened and unsweetened pistachio paste. Um, it's kind of nullified here because I did use so much of that praline paste um, that it's a little bit more brown than green anyway, but the flavor is, is, is pretty nice. Um, so we're simply melting that cocoa butter. We're adding, uh, in this case, the pistachio paste, the praline paste, and then there, there's a decision we can make. Because it's got cocoa butter in it, it's gonna set up to some degree. And when it sets up um, to a soft set because of that, um, it's spoonable, it's spreadable. Um, so I might use that in like a little jar as a spread. Um, but we can also temper it or crystallize it because it has cocoa butter in it. And when we can um, temper it, it'll set up to almost a sliceable consistency or one that we can use in a bonbon. So since we're talking about um, uh, confections, we will adapt it to a bonbon here. So earlier before you came in, or you probably heard me, saw me doing it, uh, I already set some dark chocolate shells. This is using a Felklin 65% uh, Maracaibo. Here's a great example of how properly tempered chocolate contracts. That's what makes molding possible. This just fell out of the mold all by itself. So we'll just pop that guy back in. We're gonna look at this again, but during the break, um, I tempered this mixture uh, using something called micronized cocoa butter. So it's cocoa butter that's in temper. It's, it's pure, stable crystal, but it's it's milled into a very, very fine powder so that we can add it to a, a melted chocolate mixture and it essentially tempers it automatically or instantly. But we could simply pour this onto the marble and work it just like pure chocolate and that would also crystallize it properly for it to set up into a sliceable consistency. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna make a little individual bonbon but we'll also do uh, some bars. Well, if you remember um, when we were discussing the tempering process earlier, 
Um, again, it's what the textbooks say, we can't measure it, but if we've properly tempered chocolate, we have roughly 1% stable cocoa butter, the type five uh, crystal form. So if we do 1% by weights, that's a great place to start. Sometimes it'll even work with half a percent. But we're gonna, I'm gonna show that technique again with the chocolate that we're gonna use to seal all of these bonbons. So this was warmed up enough to dissolve the cocoa butter crystal but not melt it out. Now it's cooled off again so it will um, not melt the shells of our bonbons. But I also thought this would be a cool thing to include because it is kind of a variation on something like a Nutella that everyone's familiar with, um, but something you can customize. Like I can see it now, macadamia nut Nutella or macadamia nut spread in a little jar and a, you know, <clears throat> an amenity uh, presentation, you know, to a VIP room. Could be pretty cool. And I just I just started working on um, a consulting project for a bakery that will be completely nut free. Like all the raw materials will be certified nut free. And I'm I'm sure I'm not smart enough to think of these things on my own. I just I'm sure somebody else has thought of it. But one thing that crossed my mind would it be cool to create something called Nutella that had no nuts in it, but. I'm sure somebody's already thought of that. If they haven't, you can't have it. I, I, it's mine. But in my chocolate making classes, we actually do uh, like a legal version because the uh, janduya it's kind of mandated by Italian law, the composition of it up to about 30% actual hazelnut ground into the chocolate. So we'll do a, a traditional legal version of Janduya often as part of the bean to bar classes that I do. So again, filling it as much as I can while still leaving the required space for sealing. This will crystallize on its own at room temperature. We will utilize refrigeration to speed up the process. Same thing with the bars. Uh, Tony, at the very, very beginning of the, the session mentioned um, that about three months ago, I opened a, a plated dessert bar in New York. And uh, one of the things we'll eventually get to, it's in an existing bakery, and we just turn over the space at night and kind of change the concept, change the vibe. But I do want to sell some pre-packaged items that people can take with them. And um, once I'm ready to produce it, the first one will be sort of a, my take on a super refined Twix bar. So I, I think it's interesting, I think pastry chefs, consciously or subconsciously get inspired by those things, right? You know, anytime you combine chocolate, caramel, and peanuts, you're really subconsciously thinking about a Snickers bar, right? Um, so I, I love taking those ideas and putting a twist on them, making them a little bit more refined, a little bit more highbrow. It's kind of fun. So if we did want to utilize this as a uh, sort of a jarred spread, run a couple little examples here. Drop in our 
pistachio mixture. I would let this set. I probably wouldn't temper it though if using it in this application because we'd want to be able to be able to be firm but spoonable. And then once it is set, this is also kind of a one size fits all recipe for this preserve. Uh, I just chose cherry because cherry and pistachio are kind of a classic combination. We have the cherry puree, sugar, pectin, in this case, lime juice is adding some of that acidity to set it to a, a soft jam-like consistency. We could pipe that over the top. Um, I would probably refrigerate these, temper them to room temperature when they need them. They would have you know, a shelf life for a week or two, but just kind of an interesting, interesting variation on sort of that classic cocoa hazelnut spread. Let's look next at this classic financier. If I had to pick a favorite French pastry, this would probably be it. Um, I've always kind of been obsessed with brown butter. And this is one of those examples of something that is defined by the brown butter as well as the almond. Um, A great um, sort of sense memory. This was now probably about 20 years ago. Um, during a trip to Paris, I uh, for a couple of years I went fairly regularly, and I always stay in this one particular neighborhood, the Seventh Arrondissement, and it's sadly closed now. But there was a great bakery. Not like a fancy pastry shop, but a boulangerie, a true boulangerie um, in that neighborhood. Uh, and the baker was a guy named Jean-Luc Pujarin. And the, you know, the first day you're there, you're, you're jet lagged, your body's all out of whack. You wake up at you know, five in the morning and you just take a walk around the neighborhood. And that was like a couple blocks away from the bakery. And all of a sudden I was just like overwhelmed by the smell of brown butter and almond. And they were probably baking financier. It was, it's actually making me weep a little bit, tear up a little bit just thinking about it. Um, so I took this classic financier, um, almond, brown butter, egg white, confectioner, sugar, flour, um, piped it into some silicone molds. Um, I do prefer little uh, metal molds because we get a little bit more browning, uh, but then we also get the variety of shapes and the ease of production with the silicone molds. But we'll do a few of each. While we uh, put that together, I'm always thinking of ways we could certainly just throw a financier onto a plate into our little basket and call it a day. But always also trying to think of ways to refine a pedophore or something as simple as a financier. So we're gonna make a, a mango fluid gel, which gives us an opportunity to talk about agar. Here's another example of where we're gonna take advantage of shear thinning properties of a hydrocolloid, of a gelling agent. So we're gonna start with water and our agar. Is everyone familiar with agar? Who, who uses it on a regular basis? It's actually probably been in use centuries longer than gelatin. Agar works very differently though. Whereas gelatin, we dissolve it in water, we heat it up, it melts, we let it set. Uh, agar actually requires a much higher temperature. We actually have to cook it. But also has a much higher um, 
setting temperature and a much higher melting temperature. It sets around 110 degrees Fahrenheit and it is thermoreversible. We can melt it down and recast it. We would have to heat it to 180 degrees Fahrenheit, very, very high. But it has those same shear thinning properties as pectin does, as does gel and gum and sodium alginate and other hydrocolloids. But agar is one of the more user-friendly to work with. So I have water, agar, I have sugar on deck. And I have a combination of mango and passion fruit purees. Passion fruit being added just to add a little bit more acidity to the mango. Here are some of the mango puree. Often people will ask me what my favorite Boiron puree is. And it kind of depends on my mood. I love some of the, the oddballs like the bergamot puree. Has anyone ever tasted that? That's like, it's, it's the, the bitter aromatic citrus fruit that is the flavor of Earl Grey tea. And Boiron does a puree of it. It's amazing. Because it's also something that's very hard to find fresh in season. And the season is very short. Um, but there's like oddballs like that. And then it's usually my favorite, depending on the day and my mood, is either mango or coconut. So the agar water mixture has come up to a boil. I'm going to lower the heat slightly, maintain a very slight simmer for about a minute or two. And then we're gonna add the sucrose and the mango puree. So key here is not heating the mango puree, that's gonna preserve the flavor. I am, however, because it was in the refrigerator, I'm gonna just take the chill off of it by warming it in the microwave just for a few seconds. Because what happens if I add this mango puree, which is a very cold, to the agar mixture, the temperature is gonna drop rapidly. And I'm gonna actually get premature setting. I'm going to get the shear thinning sooner than I want to have it. Not hot, just to take the chill off. All right. So the heat is off on the water and agar. I'm going to go ahead and add my sugar, add my essentially room temperature mango and passion fruit and whisk together. The uh, resulting texture of agar is also quite different from gelatin. Gelatin is long textured, chewy, elastic. Agar is kind of short textured, brittle, crumbly. This, by the way, is probably two to three times the amount of agar we would typically use for something we would eat, like an agar jelly we would eat on its own. So it's going to give us a very, very firm texture. Once that's blended in, we're just going to pour it out and let it set. Now this larger quantity will take, I mean, it'll set at room temperature eventually, but I'm just going to pour out a small quantity here to show you how rapidly it sets. Okay, we see how liquid that is, right? We'll return to this in a minute or two. Once that does set, I simply take what's essentially a big puck of mango and passion fruit rubber ball, like consistency, um, chop that up a little bit just with a knife or, 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 or say an offset spatula, and blend it in the blender. Um, I've tried lots of different types of blenders. I'm sure you all know what kind of blender this is. Not all blenders are made alike. And this type of blender, very powerful, variable speed blender, is really ideal for it. Um, I also find when doing small quantities, like the narrower the pitcher of the blender is, the better. Sometimes larger capacity blenders have a very wide base. It just takes forever to get it going. But essentially what we end up with 
mask with that sheer thinning, we go from hard rubber ball consistency to a nice soft pipeable consistency. Just like with the black currant gel. Um, often I describe this as almost like the consistency of lemon curd. And often I will make these types of fluid gels with very acidic purees like lemon, calamansi, yuzu, passion fruit. Things I'll also make in a kind of traditional curd preparation. What's the difference? Well, lemon curd has lots of sugar, lots of eggs, lots of fats. The puree is cooked in the process and there's nothing wrong with lemon curd or passion fruit curd or yuzu curd. But if I can create something that has the same texture, but it's water, sugar I can control, and fruit puree that's never been heated, all of a sudden I have a very different expression of that flavor. Uh, and sometimes I'll use them side by side just to show them. Um, so we're gonna use this as a garnish for um, our financier. And then to kind of bring us home, and then we'll start to return back to all these different preparations. Um, we'll look at a crunchy pot of choux. So very standard, don't wanna look in the oven for that. Standard pot of choux mixture. You can't really deviate from any of the, the normal proportions of ingredients, otherwise you would no longer have pot of choux. But I have over time kind of worked out that, at least for me, I like a blend of all purpose and high gluten flour. I like, um, using butter as my fat. I like using um, a mixture of water and milk for my liquid. I just find that those give me the best results for what I'm looking for. So there is a lot of, even with classic preparations like that, there is a lot you can do to continue to refine them, which is hopefully often the goal. So we have classic pot of choux. Um, as much as I think it's important for chefs and our young cooks to have those manual piping skills, we should be able to pipe 10 trays of macaroons and have each one be exactly the same size and shape. Um, I also think it's important to use tools and technology when we can. You know, so why not make our pot of choux perfectly consistent in size and shape? by using silicone molds. Now we're not gonna bake these in the silicone mold, it's just we're using the silicone mold as a tool to create a uniform shape. So I'm using these little half sphere silicone molds. I'm overfilling slightly, which can then allow me to go back and smooth off the surface. Because this is gonna be the bottom of the shoe puff that's gonna be in contact with the tray. We want it to be smooth so it doesn't roll around after we mold it, unmold it. So then these go in the freezer, again, using the freezer as a tool. Although with this method, we can constantly have a rotation of pot of shoe in the freezer. So we're, we're always 10 minutes away from pot of shoe going in the oven, which is not a bad thing. And now once we take them out of the freezer, which is not as cold as a freezer should be at the moment. So we're gonna imagine that we just pop those out. But yes, if it is completely frozen, we'll pop out these little mounds of shoe. We can arrange them on a sheet tray, let them temper slightly and then right into the oven, okay? Let's, let's go ahead and pretend here. I can still pipe things to a consistent size and shape if I need to. Uh, as far as pot of shoe goes, <clears throat> I have a theory that once you go crunchy shoe, it's hard to go back to shoe without any crunchy surface. So the second recipe here, this uh, shoe sablé, 
is essentially almost equal parts butter, sugar, flour. If you think about other mixtures that are equal parts butter, sugar, flour, um, something that's close is like streusel topping. You know, what we sprinkle on a muffin before we put it in the oven. Um, we mix streusel topping just so it's kind of coarse and crumbly and then stop. This is essentially that, that same proportion of ingredients mixed to a cohesive dough. Anything we add to a dough or a batter, from pancake batter to stiff bread dough, any ingredient is either gonna add structure, it's gonna toughen it, or it's gonna weaken it, it's gonna tenderize it. Because we're equal parts flour, butter, sugar, that high proportion of butter and sugar are adding lots of tenderizing effects. So if I were to actually bake this as a cookie, as a normal cookie, it would spread out to a super thin you know, wafer. Um, but that works for us and to our advantage because as this shoe puff expands, the surface of this sable will expand with it. If we use like a normal sable cookie, even sheeted it out to a millimeter and a half, which this is, it would set before the shoe had an opportunity to fully expand. This is also great because this, this sable can be re resheated over and over again without working the gluten too much, again, because there's so much fat and sugar that's acting as a tenderizer. Um, if I had to, if you had to guess, you know, of these shoe puffs, covered versus uncovered, which one is actually gonna puff more in the oven? Covered with the sable or uncovered? Nobody wants to play? Uncovered. Makes sense, right? Because there's nothing weighing it down. Let's test that theory out. And that agar fluid gel sets very rapidly at, at room temperature. It's actually still slightly warm, but it's, it's set. So again, once this completely sets and cools, we would blend it into this pipeable consistency. And again, the reason for that is, is it just <clears throat> produces something that's more fruit, more flavor forward. So then to fill our shoe puff, we're gonna do kind of a riff off of a classic um, cream preparation. Uh, is everyone familiar with Paris Brest? Probably behind Financier, probably my second favorite French pastry. Um, typically a mousseline or a pastry cream that has uh, some additional butter and uh, praline paste added to it. So here we start with hazelnut praline paste and butter. You know, typically we're looking at uh, either a 50-50 hazelnut and sugar proportion in the praline paste, or sometimes it's 60-40 hazelnut and sugar. Sometimes we see a little bit of almond blended in. Sometimes we see a little texture. This just happens to be a 50-50 that's smooth. And a fairly dark roast on the hazelnuts. Room temperature butter. And we're just gonna work this in the mixer with a paddle. And earlier I already put together a uh, coconut pastry cream that I pulled out to room temperature just to temper slightly so it's not ice cold. Again, this is a function of kind of the same idea as, you know, what can be water? You know, we, we started to discuss this a few moments ago. The composition of coconut milk or coconut puree um, is not that far off from something like heavy cream. 
So if we substitute some of our liquid in a classic pastry cream for a coconut puree, um, now all of a sudden we have a coconut pastry cream. So our final puree of the day are coconuts. Again, probably my favorite of the line. So once our uh, butter and praline paste is adequately combined, you know, this butter is perfectly room temperature. We can slowly start to add our pastry cream. Now the reason why I tempered it slightly is because what happens if I have nice, soft, room temperature butter and I start adding refrigerator temperature cream to it, it's gonna seize up and the mixture's gonna break. When that happens, I can simply just add a little heat to the bowl, hit the bowl with the blowtorch just very gently to, to kind of bring it back together. But it's the same thing, it's why we use, you know, uh, room temperature eggs when we're making cakes and cookies. It helps us just create a more stable emulsion. Or simply a cake batter that isn't broken. Check in on those shoe. Yeah, it'll take a few minutes, but we'll start to see the difference in the rise of the uncovered versus the covered. We'll add this coconut pastry cream in stages, stop it, scrape down the bowl. Especially at the beginning of the process, if we add the pastry cream too, too rapidly, we could get lumps of the, the butter and the praline paste. I'm sorry? Slight different composition, but miles apart in flavor. I mean, you, you, ta you taste the, the, the frozen coconut puree. I mean, it's, it doesn't even compare with coconut milk. <laughs> I'm not 100% familiar with the, the canned coconut milk, but I, I assume there might be a slightly more water in the frozen puree. But I've never had any major um, catastrophes if I've seen a recipe that called for coconut milk and substituted the puree. It's, depending on what it is, it's typically not a problem. But yeah, from a flavor perspective, they don't even compare. And add to that the fact that, you know, Boiron is sourcing even though the factory is in the south of France, and historically most of the, the farmers and the orchards that they work with are in that same um, region. Today, basically they source the fruits from wherever the best example of that fruit is grown. So coconuts predominantly coming from say Thailand. Um, 
grapefruit come from Texas, uh, mangoes come from India. And there have been times where if quality has not been deemed worthy enough, they won't buy that fruit. You know, and there might be, doesn't happen very often, like once every few years, there might be a brief period where there's a puree that's short for a couple of months because they're not gonna make it unless they have um, the ultim optimum qu quality. All right. Yeah, this, this pari breast cream is, I could just eat this with a spoon every day for the rest of my life. All right, so we're gonna to start to circle back to each of these. So you get a chance to finally taste them. You've all been incredibly uh, quiet. Does anybody have any questions about anything we've talked about, anything that we haven't talked about that maybe involves the purees or pastry in general? I have, I have. The, the key to soft serve is um, it's typically a far lower fat content. And you, you often have to uh, add a little bit more of a stabilizer to it to account for the fact that it's almost constantly moving. Um, I couldn't give you a formula off the top of my head, but I've, I've, done, I've done some, some soft serve work too. You know, the most important thing um, when it comes to especially purees and, uh, and ice cream is realizing you just can't take, you know, a white or plain ice cream base or gelato base and simply add a fruit on top of that. Um, you have to almost balance those individually per uh, fruit puree because what are you adding? When you're adding fruit puree, not only adding the flavor and maybe a little bit of natural sugar, but you're also adding a lot of water that has to be compensated for. Um, so that's something that a lot of people struggle with. But again, the, those parametric recipe charts that you can get from the website or probably even through the, the, the sales reps um, give you a blueprint for that that you can always use as a guide and, and tweak to your own liking. What was the next question that I interrupted? Uh, you want it to cool slightly, you know, so you're, you're, you, what, what have you done? You've taken the milk, or in, in my case, your milk and water and butter, a little bit of salt and sugar, you've brought it to a boil. I take it off the heat, I add the flours, uh, and then you continue to cook that. So it's very, very hot. So typically you would transfer that to a mixer bowl and cool it down. Generally, I would cool it down to somewhere probably no higher than say uh, 95 degrees Fahrenheit. I'd let it cool to that extent. Because if you start to adding the eggs when it's too hot, you can kind of prematurely cook some of the egg and that can be a problem. That's my theory anyway. We're gonna get these bonbons sealed up. Yes. Here's a great example. Um, I've been writing recipes with these purees now for many years. Um, and I, I kind of recently dusted off a uh, mandarin sorbet recipe that was formulated for, you know, years ago, the mandarin had uh, sugar added to it. Um, and in recent years, it's become 100%. So it was simply a matter of comparing the bricks level of the old puree with the new one, which was a significant difference, almost eight, eight, eight degrees of difference. So essentially, um, 
the 100% has half the solids. So if I would have made the 100% puree, according to my old recipe, it would have been icy. So I had to add just a little bit more solids in the forms of sugar or glucose or dextrose to, to get the right balance. But again, because we're, we're given that information, that gives us the, the ability to make those changes. Granite, <laughs> granita. <laughs> um, yeah, and batch freezers are, are even more expensive. Um, that's tough. I mean, often when it comes to um, ice cream and you know ice cream gelato machines, I mean I'm not trying to be a jerk about it, but yeah, you kind of get what you pay for. You know, so a thirty thousand dollar machine is gonna make far superior product than a $300 tabletop machine. But sometimes those, you can make those work to your advantage. Um, I actually worked on a project recently, it was just for kind of an R&D project, um, but I had to make multiple ice creams and sorbets in like a three hour window using those like tabletop machines that you have to put in the freezer. Um, and they, they work okay. Um, but you do get what you pay for. Um, you know, I, it's been years since I've tried it, but I've also done things where uh, you could take a, you know, say a sorbet base, I think it works better for fruit-based sorbets than gelato or ice cream, where you, um, you freeze the mixture, um, and then you take it out and you just whiz it up in a food processor. It's still gonna be slightly icy. Um, but that, that's one possible approach. I'm not sure if I understand the question. Do you use a puree for like... Oh, for like, like savory applications? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, and, and that's also a benefit to the, uh, the fact that, you know, half the line is sugar-free. You know, that, that's one less hurdle you have to work around. Um, so yeah, I mean, so many of these can be used in, as vinaigrettes, you know, bases for marinades. Um, one use we're finding, well, a growing um, market has been uh, behind the bar. So if your bartenders, mixologists aren't using fruit purees, like you should be collaborating with them. Uh, but also craft brewers, um, you know, it seems like half the beers you see on the market now are, have some sort of fruit element. Um, we're working with a lot of breweries um, to include purees in their products as well. Things like the, the red plum and blueberry, blackberry are good. really good in the sauces for, for proteins as game meats, yeah. um, game poultry, even some pork. So, so the, the sugar that's being added to purees is actually in the form of invert sugar, which we talked about earlier. And that is a benign process that involves water and acid. So there, there's certainly no animal processing. Um, and the reason why invert sugar is used is simply for stability. Um, it allows the, the purees to maintain both their homogenous nature and their color in the freeze thaw process. So it just makes it a little bit more stable. But there's there's nothing in the processing of invert sugar that's that's of any alarm. I'd like to add also to the And when people find out you know how to make a gummy bear, the, the conversation often turns to, 
Have you ever tried putting X, Y, or Z in that gummy bear? So that, that's also an interesting market that's out there. I don't know anything about it personally. Okay, so we, uh, we allowed our, uh, our ganache center to set. Uh, let's see, we, you know, we used the refrigerator a little bit to set a little bit more. Obviously, I pulled it out to temper back to room temperature. I don't wanna put tempered chocolate on a cold mold because it's gonna seize up. But we're actually starting to see already, I don't have three hands, but we're starting to see some of the contraction of that shell that we applied. Again, just to keep things kind of clean, why not use a pastry bag to apply our base? And then just one swipe is all I want. I, I don't recall the name of the place I went to when I was here two years ago, but apparently like one of the classic shave ice places. And when I got back to the States, I was so, yeah, I had this great shaved ice. And I was like, it's shave ice. It's not shaved ice. Like I would never make that mistake again. Let's get a little bit more here. And at the risk, at the risk of opening up the floodgates, um, again, you know, I, I'm happy to to share a, a copy of the presentation, which has a little bit more of that technical information. Um, and if you give me a card, I'll send that to you. Obviously, then you'll have a way to contact me. I'm, I try to be as punctual as possible. But if you ever have a technical question about the purees, um, you can go through uh, a sales rep, through Tony. Um, you can also come directly to me. If I don't know the answer, I can probably easily find out. Um, we were kind of talking when I did it with the last batch, but um, I was using that micronized cocoa butter to temper the chocolate that we're using to seal our bonbons. So again, adding roughly 1%, making sure that the chocolate has cooled to about 95 degrees Fahrenheit so that I don't simply melt out those stable crystals. Chef, did you take cocoa butter chips or... or no, this is this is a this is a product. So AUI uh, produces a, a, a micronized cocoa butter product. Um, cocoa berry does as well. Back in the lab, I simply use that that it's a machine called Easy Temper that holds cocoa butter at that perfect state indefinitely, so it's a little bit easier to work with. But the caveat is those those machines are a thousand dollars. Um, but they can change your life if you're tempering chocolate in a, in a challenging environment. A very hot kitchen, very small quantities, 
Like usually they say in a, in a conventional, conventional tempering methods, you know, what's the, uh, you know, what's the minimum of chocolate you should temper like a pound or two. I regularly temper 20 to 50 grams of chocolate at a time. That's like a half a bar, but it works really well. You just have to observe temperatures, that's all. Yes. And I found that the ideal bricks, I mean, for the, the purees needs to be around 20%. So for the purees that are below the 20% bricks, would you recommend um, increasing sugar in the recipe or perhaps using an invert? Um, yeah, you'd want to probably um, add some more solids um, to make up for that, depending on what kind of cake it is. Uh, sometimes another consideration that, that sometimes needs a little adjustment is leavening. Um, so one thing I often do is I'll, I'll use puree as a, um, a base in like a chiffon style cake. because it's somewhere, something where we're adding water, right? Um, and that water can be anything if we ask ourselves what can be water. And when you use a very acidic puree, like when I do a passion fruit chiffon, sometimes I need to play around with the leavening a little bit, uh, usually a little less. Um, in that regard. Um, that's actually another great use for invert sugar uh, that I didn't mention earlier, um, is because it binds moisture uh, more so than regular sucrose. And cakes that have a tendency to dry out, like I think a madeleine is being one, um, substituting maybe five to 10% of just the sugar with invert sugar will maintain shelf life for a little bit longer. It'll hold on to more moisture. So why continue to work? We, I think this is just the, the, the fun dialogue part of the, the presentation. You can continue to ask some questions, but I'll talk a little bit about um, this new project that I started. I'll give you some examples of some of the work we're doing there, because uh, it's kind of the first time in about six years that I've kind of been in the New York plated dessert scene, at least under my own banner. And of course, we're using purees everywhere. Uh, so it's a, uh, as I mentioned, it's a bakery uh, that's been open for about a year and a half on Manhattan's Upper West Side called Ricolt. It's a French word for harvest. And we kind of kept things simple by calling it Recolte Dessert Bar. But the, uh, the consulting baker is a baker from uh, Taipei in Taiwan, who's won a bunch of awards, the Coupe de Monde de Boulangerie. So it's, a, it's a kind of a classic French style with a little bit of like, I don't know how to describe it, a little that lightness that comes from sort of the Asian perspective. So our uh, menu formats, actually this is, we're gonna look at this a little bit when we finish up some of these, uh, these pedophore pieces. This is our pedophore presentation, little nested box. So the box, it's basically two like container store boxes um, that nest together. So when it comes out to the table, you just see the three pieces on the top or the one piece on the top and then we, remove the lid and then there's another piece and then we remove the interior and there's a third piece. So it's kind of fun, interactive. Once the server leaves, people tend to put it back together so they can like take a video of it opening up again. But the funny thing is, is one of those, because of the construction of the boxes, one of those pedophores always has to be flat, the one that goes on the very bottom. So in the picture there you see a uh, like a chocolate mendillon with cocoa nibs and sea salt and orange peel. And I didn't think about that when we started doing it, like something always has to be super flat. So I joke, I've been boxed in by my pedophore presentation. <laughs> Thanks for getting my dad humor. <laughs> <laughs> 
but it's a three course uh, format. Almost like a prefix restaurant, but dessert only. So there's a pre-dessert that changes every day. It's usually something very seasonal, fruit forward. I think tonight they're doing um, rhubarb and yogurt and basil as the uh, sort of flavor combinations of the pre-dessert. And then you order from this uh, menu of six, again, kind of main course desserts. And then the pedophore presentation at the end. So again, kind of like a little three course dessert tasting, although that makes it sound way more fancier than it needs to be. So this was our opening menu. We opened in January. We've already started to change the menu a little bit. I just don't have all the professional photographs in, but this was the menu that we opened up with in the middle of the winter. Uh, so also the first time I ever played around with using kind of proper names and naming the desserts. In all the years I worked at Le Bernardin, it was strawberry, because <laughs> that was you know, the focus of the dessert. Um, but here I kind of started to play around with giving things names, which is harder than it, harder than it looks. Um, but this is vert, so the French word for green. Um, not only green colors, but green flavors. So here we used um, puree in the, uh, this lime parfait, uh, set on a citrus uh, biscuit, sprayed with a, a light green uh, white chocolate and cocoa butter spray. Uh, grapefruit sorbet, also utilizing the puree. Uh, we did a, a lime meringue, not a true meringue with egg whites, but one made with um, hydrolyzed soy protein, which kind of mimics the effect of an egg white. And then an avocado puree, a basil microwave sponge. Has anyone played, played with that technique of the microwave sponge? you know, baked in a paper cup. Um, we achieved that by using white chocolate as a base and then um, making like a basil puree in a, uh, a Paco Jet. So I'm not like super intimate with the, the ins and outs of this particular oven. But generally speaking, you know, these shoe puffs, let me show you with one of these. Typically the, the covered puff rises like twice as much and more consistently than the uncovered. Because if you think about it, what starts to restrict the puff of pot of shoe, the surface dries out. But that sable over the top forms like a protective layer that keeps it from drying out. Sometimes when I ask that question, I ask people if they wanna put money on it and then it kind of becomes evident that it's a trick question. I won a few Mai Tais the other day at the other demo, but I never got them, sadly. <laughs> uh, so the Ver, uh, we were supposed to open um, in the late fall. So the uh, original name for this dessert was going to be autumnal, but when we opened in January, it's no longer autumn. So uh, I quickly shifted gears and we called it Harvest, which is a play off the name of the bakery, Recolt. But it was supposed to evoke kind of autumn harvest flavors. So this was a play on a sweet potato tart, or it was a sweet potato tart, but kind of a play on pumpkin pie. Again, a little bit more refined in nature. Uh, the tart shell, we made these by hand. 
which probably only about one out of every 10 guests appreciated the fact that we were making a cylindrical tart shell like this. But it requires you to essentially sheet and then cut out measured strips for the sides and then the interior. We would basically use like a, I bought a bunch of ring cutters of one size to use as the interior. Um, again, lots of effort that most people didn't realize. Oh, that's pretty special. Uh, but I figured you would all think that that was worth it. Uh, sweet potato custard, uh, dried meringue, a cream puree that we make almost like a fluid gel with the milk and heavy cream. So it's like a lightened version of a pastry cream. Almost. Um, pistachio lemon confit, that uh, those discs are chocolate garnish uh, made with like the roasted white chocolate. We serve that with a red wine caramel on the plate and a um, brown butter ice cream. And the brown butter came from uh, not brown butter itself, but by taking heavy cream and reducing it to the point where all that was left was uh, clarified butter and the brown milk solids itself, which takes about an hour and a half. But you get a much higher quality of uh, brown milk solid that way. Anything I can do to make things more difficult, I love doing. <laughs> because it makes your cook so happy. Uh, this one is actually on the Bois Run website. So we're, we're applicable. Um, when things come off the menu at Recolte, they go onto the website at, uh, at Bois Run. So this is a flare or flour uh, that is inspired by flavors of India. So we have uh, coconut sorbet. We have a uh, mango in the form of this mango fluid gel that I made for the uh, financier, as well as a mango chip, like a mango twill. So that's mango puree, egg white, sugar. Uh, I mean, I don't know if it's baked or dried, but essentially baked in a very, very low oven. And while it's still pliable and warm, we just kind of crinkle it up a little bit. And it wasn't really on purpose, but people were like, oh, that looks like kind of like the petals of a flower. You're so like smart. I'm like, okay, sure. <laughs> um, a pistachio sponge. Um, a, those cylinders are a yogurt panna cotta. And that yogurt panna cotta is wrapped in a rose gelée. One of my favorite flavor combinations to work with. Because a lot of people don't really think of flavors of India that much. Um, even if you hear coconut, mango, rose, pistachio, and you'd be like, yeah, that sounds, that sounds good. So it's not always easy to pull off bonbons in a four hour demo, but I think we did it. So I think the easiest way we'll do this is I'll do like some kind of finished presentation stuff up here, but we'll also just pass around a couple plates that we can take from to taste. So to a couple more. I don't know how you want to distribute them, but I'll do a second one as well. <laughs> that would be cool. I've always loved the idea of using a varine glass as a, as a vehicle. Look at the shine. Perfect. So I, I intend to always have some sort of varine uh, dessert on the menu. This one has, has not yet changed, so this is currently on the menu. Um, it's kind of a study in passion fruit. I love using the purees as a way of uh, kind of showcasing different techniques, which in turn show us uh, different expressions of the flavor. So the layers here, the cream layers, are a uh, kind of a straight up passion fruit curd, like we were talking about. 
Uh, there's a layer of a mascarpone cream and then a uh, milk chocolate cream. And then the garnish on that, on top of that, are uh, a passion fruit chiffon, which we just talked about. So you can find my sugar from before. Where did I put it? Uh, passion fruit chiffon. Uh, passion fruit pearls uh, made with that um, agar and cold oil technique. Has anyone ever seen that? Where you uh, make an agar mixture with water, sugar, in this case, passion fruit puree, and then you drop that, it's a cold oil. So little gelled pearls of passion fruit. We have a, a version of this passion fruit marshmallow that instead of coating it in the dextrose, I actually coat it in olive oil. Um, so that gives it a little bit of, of kind of an olive oil flavor, but also keeps it from sticking to things. And then a uh, passion fruit sorbet. On the top is this white chocolate deco, passion fruit fluid gel, a little bit of lime zest. But I, I always kind of want to use this presentation to kind of show that multiple expression of a single flavor. I also always intend to have a uh, cheese. We didn't open with a liquor license, unfortunately. Um, that's coming in the next couple weeks. But it also will afford us like some fun opportunities to play with some wine pairings. But I love the idea of uh, using a cheese course to kind of play around with both sweet and savory elements. So the first cheese that we, uh, we kind of opened with here is a Petit Basque. So it's actually from the south of France, but still the same Basque region that, that borders Spain. Uh, sheep's milk cheese, and I kind of love the idea of, you know, what grows together goes together. Or let, let's look at the cuisine, the flavors of that region, and, and riff off of those. So we have the Petit Basque cheese, we have a fig pot de fouille. Uh, fig is one of those that doesn't have a lot of its own natural pectin, uh, so we do incorporate a little bit of apricot puree into that. And we actually use these, uh, the same frames I used for the uh, raspberry caramel is what I used uh, for this fig puree or fig pot de fouille. We just uh, set it into a block and then cut thin slices off of it. Um, but I didn't talk about, and I actually haven't talked about it here. It's in the recipe handout. You see the little yellow, uh, the yellow squares there? That's a lemon cone fee. So that's actually the peel of fresh lemons, uh, blanched and then cooked down in a syrup using lemon puree and sugar. So it's like super intensely lemon. Um, we have leftover syrup from that. So I take the lemon cone fee syrup and then mix it with olive oil, almost like in a vinaigrette uh, proportion, three to one. And we actually put a few drops in that pot de fouille and kind of make it kind of shiny, give it a little bit of additional flavor. Uh, we have a uh, Marcona almond praline, almost like a brittle, that's uh, rolled out super thin, broken up into pieces. We have a semolina, honey and semolina cake that's broken up into pieces. We have uh, those, that nasturtium leaf, one of my favorite herbs, just from a visual perspective, but also gives a little bit of a peppery quality. And then that swipe along the left side is uh, smoked paprika. And then the dots on the right are a uh, peach vinegar gastrique. So again, kind of playing with both sweet and savory elements. I missed one. Ah, there's not one on there. Uh, I missed one of the chocolate ones. Um, like the, the primary chocolate dessert that we started with is uh, something we called campfire. And that was a smoked chocolate mousse uh, with a soft marshmallow fluff interior. The challenge with that one is, you know, to do an interior for a mousse, you have to freeze it in a silicone mold so you can pop it out of the mold, insert it into your mousse. 
Marshmallow fluff is mostly sugar, right? Sugar is lower the freezing point of water. So it was really, really difficult without a blast freezer to freeze that marshmallow solid enough that we could mold it cleanly. So that was an interesting challenge that we never quite found a solution to. Um, but the smoked chocolate mousse, so we just took chocolate and smoked it with the PolyScience uh, smoking gun. Um, that had a milk chocolate, uh, you know, shiny glaze over it. That sat on a reconstructed graham cracker. So we basically made a very thin sablé that um, used ground graham cracker crumbs as the flour and then made another sablé from that. And then that was served just with chocolate ice cream and a uh, toasted meringue. So we made sheets of um, dried meringue and then just before serving it, we would hit that with a blowtorch and it just would <laughs> fill the space with like the smell of toasted marshmallow essentially. And as I mentioned, our, um, our Petaphor presentation also just changes by day. But we're usually doing some sort of pot de fouille, some sort of fruit element, some sort of chocolate element, some sort of cakey element. But you see there the, the financier with the chocolate deco on the top. That was just a simple way of kind of upgrading what could just be a simple piece of cake, um, giving a little bit more character by adding the creamy element, adding the chocolate deco. So yeah, it's a fun, it's a fun medium to be working in again after kind of being out of restaurants for the last six years. All right, that should cover some pot de fouille. So for example, for, for the Petaphor box, that's why I'm, I started doing pot de fouille in this very thin shape. But it's also kind of cool because I, I, you very rarely see it in something this thin. And then of course our gummy bears. Toss those in there. Again, these, these, these gummy bears will kind of change over time as they dry out. So you can kind of customize to a certain extent the consistency. If you like them firmer and chewier or softer. Before anybody asks, I haven't really played around with doing alcohol-based gummies. But yeah, gelatin does behave a little bit differently when working with alcohol. Any other questions? No questions? Really? That's either a good sign or a horrible sign. Really good. All right, if you say so. Okay, I'll throw some questions out to you. What are you, some of your favorite purees that are in your repertoire? Raspberry. Raspberry? What, what is uh, currently number one globally? Is it strawberry, mango, one of those two? Which is not surprising to me at all. That's actually good in the gummy bears, blood orange. Yes. How would they hold up for like a uh, flavoring, 
Sure. I mean, it would, it, would, it would depend on what the application is. Usually they're used for very different applications. You know, sometimes, sometimes you just can't use a puree because of the water content. Um, you know, but either, even compounds and extracts are very volatile. volatile. Um, sometimes those flavors don't, don't last very long. Has anyone ever used the guava? I use a lot of guavas. The guava is amazing. I use that for cheesecake. It works great. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have any in my back pocket. <laughs> Exactly. Just on like a, you know, a, a sill pad or plastic or parchment lined uh, sheet pan, just that ambient. You know, I, I check them every, you know, like once a day. Usually, it, it depends a lot on the humidity. Usually, um, two days of, of drying is how I like them. But you can always serve them a little softer. So some of these were made yesterday. Some of these were made on uh, Tuesday. There's more coming. And again, there's a little bit of that um, orange zest oil included in the, the oil that's been used to coat it. So we're incorporating flavor a little bit that way too. And I don't know if we've talked much about the new packaging, guys, but we I, I'll, I'll throw a few of these out into the crowd here. Um, this lid will not come off unless you intend for it to come off. Because you know how it goes sometimes with those really fluid purees uh, with the old packaging, if you just stare at it hard enough, it'll leak, right? It's nobody's fault. But... Uh, these are much sturdier. They stack nicer, I think, in, on the shelf in the in the freezer. What's the shelf like? Ah, so frozen. There is a use by date that should be on the package. Um, once it's thawed but unopened, you're looking at about two weeks. Once it's opened, about seven days. And in, in in practical um, terms, I've noticed that the more acidic the lower the pH, like you can get an extra couple of days out of, say, passion fruit or the calamansi or the yuzu. And I, I will say, I have taken open containers and that can still <coughs> anywhere from coconut, mango, lily koi, and got another two or three weeks shelf life out of it. At the, the last demo that we did uh, in Kona, <laughs> a, uh, when it. So, is it. Okay, should you scrape that off, or is that okay to just put it on the puree? So is that just the, the moisture? If it's inside, if it's inside, I'll, I'll incorporate that back in. Okay. Yeah. That's just a little bit of evaporation that takes place. And yeah, despite all the measures to make it more stable, I mean, that's just inevitable. Mm -hmm. So now with the new packaging, for instance, one of the things are getting sturdier, are getting uh, easier to reseal. And we actually have uh, tons of uh, videos. Like, if you, if you go to the Leverage of uh, online on YouTube, we can pass on some of them and we can show you how the, the different system is pretty cool. It's pretty handy. And then, apart from that, we have like uh, on our website. We have, can you put that back in presentation uh, mode? <laughs> uh, Sorry. We have a, uh, also a Thank you. So yeah, when when the new um, when the new packaging was was officially announced uh, a few months back, all of the European kind of people that do what I do, all the European chefs, they did these like fun. 
photo shoots. So we did one as well. And we're like, what, are we, what can we do to kind of like uh, show that, you know, these things are virtually indestructible and you can throw them around. I'm going the opposite direction. Um, my idea was sort of the, got the cover shot. I'm like, let's show us playing Jenga with the uh, puree containers. There we go. I look way more enthused than I should be too. <laughs> Uh, but when I was in, when we were in Kona, we did. You guys saw a little bit more than they did actually. Um, but the uh, the marshmallow. Somebody asked if these can be uh, like torched or if they just melt immediately. And the answer is once they they kind of dry out, the surface dries out a little bit after the dextrose has been added. Uh, yeah, they torch up just fine. But any anytime you're looking to brown something like that, it's all about. Moisture, so the, the drier the surface is, the better. Yeah, no acid uses preservatives or additive. concentrates added for flavor or colors. <laughs> and I'm also kind of a, I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to like, large scale manufacturing and like visiting the factory. They didn't let me see everything, but it was like super impressive uh, how the factory was designed. It's, it's fairly recent. Juan might be able to tell us when. How, what, when was a, the current factory, when was it built? Like fairly recently, right? Yes, yeah, so we uh, built about uh, five years ago. Yeah, so we built it in 2014. Again, it's depending on how it's stored and how well it's wrapped, um, weeks. Yeah, I mean, typically what I'll do with these is I'll, I'll wrap them in little individual cellophane. Um, I don't know if that's enough, but if, if it's not, I can cut up some of the bars. Um, you know, from a formulation standpoint, like they're not gonna go moldy or bacteria is not gonna grow on them because there's so much sugar, what can happen is they can eventually start to crystallize. But if you look at the recipe, there's far more glucose than there is actual sucrose. So when that's the case, it would take a long, long, long time for that to happen. The same with the, the, the gummy bears as well. This is like my, one of my favorite bar shapes. This is what that high-end Twix will eventually come in. But these can be really nice for a more of a VIP, I guess you could say. Yeah, if you come to New York, hopefully we'll we'll see you in the dessert bar. All the social media websites. And just convince Why How to bring me back again next year. We'll talk we'll talk about something different. All right, we are almost done. Any other questions? Anything else you want to talk about? Yeah. Ah. So um, we, we saw a slide with it in, in the recipe handout. There's that two-tone pot de fouille. That was a uh, kind of attempt to do like a cocktail-inspired pot de fouille that's uh, grapefruit and Campari. Um, and again, I was, I was kind of joking about this the other day in my, you know, ivory tower of academia, I don't have to worry about production. So what, what, I, what I did was um, I made that using those little metal frames that I use for the caramel, but certainly could do it on a larger scale. But to get those, I made them separately. So it was two different pot de fouilles, I let them cool. And if you make pot de fouille often, you, you know that um, when they cool, the side that's exposed to air is stickier, right? Sometimes if they touch, like you cannot get those apart. So I actually will stick those two sides together. Obviously it's easier to do when you have a smaller piece than if say you do a big frame like that. 
Um, I've also heard, so the, 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 the original inspiration for, for that was uh, Pierre Hermé was one of the first people I ever saw do sort of a two-tone pot de fouille. And I went to ask somebody who worked at Pierre Hermé in Paris how they did that. And they said that they cut, like they scored the surface of it with a knife before pouring the second batch on top. Um, I tried that, it works okay too, but I like the sticky side together better. But that's another, that's another fun way to kind of just play around with flavors to make just the concept a little bit more interesting. And um, you know, another thing you can do is simply combine two flavors. Like coconut pot de fouille because of all the fat is kind of weird, but if you do coconut and pineapple together, it's, it's super delicious. And you know, what I would do is simply combine a recipe for pineapple with a recipe for coconut and just combine it. All the measurements, just combine it and it'll, it'll work. Because they work separately, they should work together. So yeah, this coconut uh, praline pari breast filling is probably one of my favorite things on the planet. I guess uh, like the, the passion fruit marshmallows. Uh, yeah, they yeah that, that frame was just to hold it in. You can use a sheet pan for sure. I just did it because um, I can control how thick it is and it's a little bit cleaner. But, but again, I, I, to keep it really clean, what I would do is I would spray the pan with a little bit of pan spray, plastic, use like a towel, then a dry towel to like work out any air bubbles so the plastic sticks to the tray and then spray the plastic. Because sometimes even to the plastic wrap, the marshmallow will stick even after it cools. So yeah, pan spray can be used for a lot of interesting things, I find. All right, so another question for you. As a pastry chef who comes here once every two years, what should I check out while I'm here in Oahu? <laughs> I'm not sure what the chuckle means, but <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, snorkeling. I was thinking something like food related, but <laughs> most cutting edge is probably same. I mean, what uh, what local fruits are here that I would just never find anywhere? Chio? Chico. Chico. What the heck is a Chico? Yeah. You should try them, but uh, see, it's pretty good at the York. Okay. It's pretty good. It's like pasta. Okay. Or you skip to Luke. Yeah, it's pretty good. I'm left. All right, last but not least. And beware that that cream, it's, it's probably a little soft, so you, you could, it could gush out as you taste that shoe puff. Thank you so much. It's one of my favorites. All right, these financier probably spent a few more minutes in the oven than I would have liked. So they might be a little dry, but otherwise they're okay. All right, guys, that's all I've got for you. Who has to go back to work or has to start work now? I sympathize. <laughs>
say, I guess if you want to do some pictures of something kind of finished. Is that what you said would be day? I'm sorry? Is that what you said would be a Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just set them on the table over here. Oh, you can do what you'd like with them. Yeah, and then we'll get some pictures of them. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Everybody left me. Yeah. Chef, do you have any closing uh, closing remarks? No. Okay. Again, guys, thanks for coming. Um, if you have any questions about anything, I'm just going to be here cleaning up. If you want to give me a business card, I'll send you this presentation that has some more of that technical information. Um, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't offer that. <laughs> First of all, only fifteen dollars a piece. Thank you. Thank you.